if you look at the amount of venture capital available in the US, sort of your dollars are not really making many impact. However, when you place the same dollars in some of the sort of a less capitalized markets, yeah. sort of you're not trying to be fashionable, you are trying to make money and create impact. If you could give me even some of those dollars and maybe a little bit of that talent, the, the impact you could have changing people's lives in Central Asia and South Asia across emerging markets is disproportionately large. And hundred dollars in, in the US is probably the equivalent of a dollar here in terms of what you can actually uh, buy with it. I mean, if you raise a $5 million seed round in the US, you're probably spending $4 million of that on salaries. If you raise $5 million here, that's probably about four years runway. We just had a wonderful conversation with Robin Butler. What did we discuss today? Kind of started started really talking about the, the origins of, of Sturgeon and, and how and why we've ended up investing in, in early stage startups here in, here in Central Asia, as well as South Asia. Uh, why, why we believe that there is an opportunity for this investment strategy, which business models or which uh, types of businesses that we, we find uh, we find interesting, we find attractive. Talk about quite a few examples from the existing portfolio to illustrate some of those points and finished up with a little bit on the, the Sturgeon Foundation and the, the, the scholarships that we're uh, providing in the, the markets that we invest in as well. Yeah, so if Mario Gabrielli wrote a canonical piece on Sturgeon Capital, we tried to record one. So uh, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Hello everyone, this is yet another episode of Envectorial Podcast. Today on our show, we have Robin Butler, partner and head of impact at Sturgeon Capital. Robin, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is our first episode in, 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 in English, so I, I, I hope I sort of, the language have, hasn't lost on me, so uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm sure you'll be all right. I'll try and speak clearly as well for, for those for whom English isn't their first language. Yeah. So um, how you just arrived in, in Almaty, like welcome back to Almaty. Uh, how, how, how was your flight? Uh, it's good to be back. Uh, I, I landed yesterday, flew overnight from London. Uh, now feels like kind of the best time of year to be in Almaty. Like if you were to... Sun shining, it's not too hot. You can kind of still wear it as sort of a t-shirt and things in the evenings. It's pretty good. Yeah, good time to, to be in Almaty for sure. Like uh, if you were to analyze, I mean, let's say the, you, the past two and a half years, how many days did you actually spend in London? Like half of a year? <laughs> like every time we talk, you are like in Pakistan or Bangladesh or like flying around the world? Um, well, I think I was calculating since the beginning of this year, well, since the middle of January, I think I've been in London for about four weeks. Got it. Um, Past five months, only a month in London. Pretty much, yeah. Got it. The uh, rest is? The rest has been on the road. Uh, this year has been Bangladesh twice, Uzbekistan twice, Kazakhstan twice, Georgia twice, Azerbaijan, Mongolia, Turkey, uh, Dubai, and Pakistan. Crazy, crazy. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that's not surprising given the fact that Sturgeon Capital is sort of a venture capital firm investing in the emerging markets. I guess we wanted to start from the thesis from um, uh, Mario Gabrielli's uh, a canonical article about Sturgeon Capital, a uh, really wonderful article on Generalist, which states that, um, which shares with sort of a surprising stats, the, the, the ratio of sort of a, the amount of venture capital per, per capita. So in, it's uh, uh, 20 cents in Bangladesh, I think roughly, uh, 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 let me look at my numbers, like a dollar, oh, sorry, point, uh, it's actually 20 cents in Uzbekistan, a dollar in Bangladesh, point, uh, $1.6 dollars in, in, in Pakistan, $75 in China, 30 bucks in, the U, uh, in, in India. And then I did some math for two missing countries there, United States and Kazakhstan. So in the US, 2021, they invested like, 350 million, 350 billion of venture capital. That's yeah. thousand plus bucks uh, per person. And in 2022, it went down to, I think, two, two, 241 billion. So that is, let's say like still like 700 or something. Yeah. And in Kazakhstan, according to the report from most ventures, the amount of venture capital uh, sort of from visible deals uh, was roughly 35 million in 2022. Yeah. That, sort of comes about to, to, let's say, two bucks per person. So we are not too far from Uzbekistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, we're sort of in that market. Why is this an opportunity for your firm? Um, so I, I think that metric is a, is a very good way of capturing the disparity, um, particularly between more, uh, more emerging economies. So I, I like to look at Indonesia as well. Uh, it's a, similar to India, around uh, $30 uh, VC funding per capita. But then if you track back and you look back, say, eight to 10 years ago, 
VC funding per capita in Indonesia was at a similar level to where we are now. Um, so if you like, it's, it's, it's one of those indicators for what we see is these markets really being primed for their digitalization. And when I say primed, I mean you have a high level of smartphone and internet penetration. Um, you have young populations, which, which helps in terms of adoption. Uh, you have had that sort of initial wave of um, you know, so social media, messaging apps, uh, ride hailing, food delivery those sort of more simple products that have accustomed people to using technology in their day-to-day -day lives, but you still haven't seen widespread, widespread penetration of software and other consumer products uh, and, 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 uh, and uh, services that you have in other emerging markets and in, and in developed markets. So what we really see is that these countries are on that same path, are following that same playbook that you've seen in other, in other emerging markets, but are at the, but are at the very beginning. Um, and if we think about it as a, a, as a firm, when you look at the uh, kind of value creation for investors as well as founders and, and for the wider society, the investors that, that were there at the beginning are ultimately the ones that have performed the best. And if you look at within their funds, it's those vintages from the early years when, 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 when these economies were just coming online and you had that rapid dig digitalization starting. What you need, and I think what is also captured by that VC funding per capita, is you, you need VC funding to unlock that. No matter, I mean, you might have some incredibly talented founders uh, building some really, really su super interesting businesses, uh, but without the VC funding uh, to really unlock them building those businesses at scale. And, and that's not to say you can't build a business without VC funding. Um, lots of people have, lots of people can, um, but really I think achieving the scale that, that you've seen in, in, in other markets does require that catalytic impact of, of VC funding. And that's, that's really where we want to be as a firm, to, bre to be that bridge between the local capital. Uh, you mentioned Moss Ventures here, here in Kazakhstan, investing across Central Asia. We see similar sort of local VCs in the markets where we invest, who are an invaluable resource in terms of not only the capital they provide, but the networks and the experience they have, especially for sort of a pre-seed and seed stage. Um, but then you have that kind of gap of no international capital really looking at these markets. It can be for a wide range of reasons, but generally just they're not being a large number of investable startups for them. So that's where we, we try and position ourselves to say that you have that local capital. We want to bridge the gap between that local capital and the international capital, both as an investor, but also as uh, a marketing agency, essentially, for these markets. So, so we do a lot, um, whether it's uh, appearing, uh, right, appearing in articles, podcasts, organizing investor trips to try and normalize the opportunity here so that international investors can understand what is going on. And uh, where we say it is, I can talk about these regions for hours on end. Uh, I talk, tell you about whether it's from a macro perspective, the quality of founders, uh, the, 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 the size of the opportunity set. If we get an investor to come and spend five minutes with one of our founders, it's a hundred times more effective. They actually really understand not only the quality of the founders, but the opportunity set and the, 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 the um, problems that they're solving. No, that's really cool. I mean, I find this approach super refreshing. I mean, it's really fashionable to invest in, let's say, uh, uh, as a foreign investor, to invest in secondary shares in, in sort of uh, some of the American companies through, com through I don't know, Equity B or any of those platforms. And yeah. then it's a, it's a sort of a, uh, uh, it's a status symbol. You can tell that sort of you're an investor in SpaceX and then some of those big, big, big companies. But if you look at the amount of venture capital available in the US, sort of your dollars are not really making many impact. However, when you do that, when you when you place the same dollars in some of the sort of a less uh, uh, capitalized markets, that's where the alpha is. And yeah. sort of you're not trying to be fashionable you're trying to do, you are trying to make money and oh, sort of, and, and make and create impact, sort of a sort of zig when everyone is zagging, so to, so to speak, right? Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, it's often how we position ourselves to investors is, uh, whether it's a family office or a more institutional investor is they, they, they obviously have their allocation, uh, uh, to, to various, um, uh, uh, various, uh, various investment opportunities. Venture is, a, usually a small part of that and emerging frontier markets are going to be a small part of that small part. Correct. But I think what it, what it does offer in a, your spot on there is, is really being that differentiated alpha, uh, within, within your portfolio where you're not, we're not saying, look, give us, give it, give us 5% of your entire wealth. 
um, because that, that, I don't think that really makes sense for, for anyone. But with that, that with that percentage of which you have available, uh, you have a differentiated source of returns and, and that really does deliver impact as well. Um, because I feel like the problems that are being solved here by technology at the moment are fundamental problems that affect people's day to day lives, whether that's businesses or consumers. Some of the, 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 the rubbish that gets funded in the US or Europe that I just feel even if it achieves everything it sets out to achieve, might improve people's lives by 5%. Correct. And you look you at don't have a and, dog walking out. Or, yeah, yeah just, exactly. Yeah. Like it's, it's Pet insurance. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's so marginal. It's, it's really on the periphery. And it's not to demean or diminish the, the efforts and the talents of those founders, but it just sort of look, and I think if you could give me even some of those dollars and maybe a little bit of that talent, the, the impact you could have changing people's lives in Central Asia and South Asia across emerging markets is disproportionately large. And you're spot on as well. Like $1 in the US is probably the, or $100 in, in the US is probably the equivalent of a dollar here in terms of what you can actually uh, buy with it. I mean, um, uh, developers probably being the, the, the prime example, if you raise a $5 million seed round in the US, you're probably spending $4 million of that on salaries. If you raise $5 million here, that's probably about four years runway, depending on what you're if doing. You're, if you're fairness, you're spending, uh a million on, on your office per month. <laughs> yeah, so. Well, you needed that special bit to get the stuff downstairs into the secret lab. <laughs> that's a good yeah. point. <laughs> so that, that, that was, uh, that's money well spent. Uh, when it comes to um, uh, quite a few places where I want to go with this conversation, I think you would love to learn more about sort of uh, the, the countries you're operating in. But before we go into that, let's have some sort of chronological uh, angle to this. So what are, what are some of the sort of the origins of strategic capital when did it get started? Which markets did it did it start from? And sort of, uh, yeah, I guess that's that's what we sure. Do. So, I mean, if we go right the way back, Sturgeon Capital was founded in two thousand five, two thousand six, by an Italian gentleman, uh, Clemente Capello, whose father had been a diplomat, and he'd spent quite a bit of time living uh, across the former Soviet Union, growing gr growing up, uh, and had traveled through Central Asia and the Caucasus as well, doing the. Um, Mongol rally where you drive from from Europe to uh, to Mongolia in a in a small small old car and it's kind of oh. an, an um, adventure a race and uh, he, he came through and this was I guess if you like in the middle of the commodity super cycle as well as you having the the impact of the reforms in uh, Georgia uh, and what he really saw was that opportunity for a an, an international fund to provide access for international investors uh, at this point it was actually to uh, focused on public markets. Um, so invested in, in investing in listed stocks from Central Asia and the Caucasus, hence the name Sturgeon, centered around the Caspian Sea, okay. um, and that's and that's really what we did for what Sturgeon did for the first ten years, ten years of its life. Um, invested heavily in Georgia, in Azerbaijan, in Kazakhstan. But public market investing. Public market investing. That's like mining and exactly. banking. Exactly, and th and that was actually really the, the the challenge is if you're if you're investing in public markets here, you have a limited universe of uh, stocks that you can invest in, predominantly natural resources or financial services. Now, this region is prone to uh, devaluations. Uh, any devaluation hammers the financial services stocks. And if you're looking at natural resources, I mean, the, the challenge you have is that kind of interlinking between public and private in these markets. And say you want to get exposure to a gold uh, to a gold miner, you can either buy the one in Canada, where you you pay a bit more, but it's pretty stable, or you buy the one in Kyrgyzstan and you get expropriated by the government every two to three years. Um, so the the challenge I think was. From a macro perspective, you could sell the Y Central Asia. From that bigger picture, you could sell the Y Central Asia. But it was very difficult to sell the Y now. Mm -hmm. Why should you be investing in Central Asia and the Caucasus now rather than in six months' time? Why, like, what's going to happen that you're going to miss out on some sort of returns or even in a year's time? Because stocks were cheap and they, 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 they always stayed cheap. Um, so actually, when, when, when I joined the firm and when Kian, uh, the now, now CEO, and Alex, the other partner, joined, uh, this was uh, the time when we'd, we'd seen that that strategy essentially didn't have a kind of long-term future for as, as a product around which we could build the firm. And I think that's uh, so, so something we're very conscious of, that it, it's not just about raising a fund and taking the management fees and things. It's saying, well, how can we build a suite of products that are really solving a problem, not only through the investments they're making, but also providing access for 
international investors to exciting uh, investment opportunities in emerging markets that can deliver them with uh, the sort of risk adjusted returns that they're looking for. Um, so that was kind of having had that presence in these markets for such a long time, uh, as well as making a few early stage investments in Iran, uh, of all places, when the sanctions were lifted and seeing that, OK, you can sell that you can sell the big picture but where are the most talented entrepreneurs where are the most exciting businesses and really they're in the private sector and really they're within the venture space um, and that's really where we kind of started doing this work on on identifying that both central asia and the caucasus as, as well as south asia by which i mean pakistan and bangladesh are at this prime stage in terms of digitalization uh, in terms of that base level foundation uh, so kind of over the last six years uh, pretty much since since i joined that's been the focus on on building that thesis, building building those networks locally as, as well as regionally and internationally, uh, and and then launching the first uh, the first VC formal VC fund in 2020. Uh, that funds made 18 that fund made 18 investments across eight different countries, including uh, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Georgia, Ukraine, Egypt, UAE, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. um, predominantly focused on sort of seed to Series A uh, stage. Um, we're now in the process of, of raising our next fund, um, which have a similar geographical mandate um, and uh, focusing on, on investing at the same sort of stage. Uh, the team as we are today is, is th three partners in London, as well as a, 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 a couple of others. And then where we're kind of that sort of that idea of bridging the gap between local and international uh, in each of the kind of core markets where we invest, we look to hire someone that uh, has either kind of investment or operating experience in those markets. Uh, to be our eyes and ears on the ground, to assist with due diligence, and then to add value and support post investment. So I have a colleague Ali John based in based in Tashkent, uh, Saad based in Karachi in in Pakistan, and we're hiring someone in Bangladesh at the moment. Um, so that's that's kind of how we've evolved o over time and, and sort of where we sit today in terms of a team and uh, if you like the products, the funds that we have. So you kept the geography constant, but you changed the, 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 the strategy from public markets to private markets, which actually makes sense. And that happened, let's say, four and a half years ago or so? Uh, or three years ago? Uh, around five years ago. Was around when five we years ago. Five or six years ago is when we really started moving away from that public market strategy. And then in 2020, you finalized sort of your, your $25 million fund, which is sort of a emerging, mar emerging opportunities one, I guess. Exactly. That's yeah. the name of your fund. And you are in the process of raising your second fund to deploy in these geographies. I guess let's not postpone this question. It's sort of a, this big elephant in the room. Would love to learn your perspective on all these geographies. You, are, you made 18 investments. You travel so much. Uh, you've been to countries I certainly haven't been to. And I guess some of the people in the audience haven't. And so let's, I guess, contrast the, the startup ecosystem in, 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 Ge in Georgia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan, uh, pros, cons, sort of, how do you see it? Uh, we, we, we let's start here for hours. No, let me. Yeah, we, can, uh, we can start uh, from. Uh, I don't know. We can move from west to east. Yeah, as, I'm as, trying to think like. where, where to start or how to kind of group uh, group countries together. So, I mean, let's let's take a, a market like um, uh, Georgia, which, from a population perspective, is is the smallest uh, where we've made an investment, mm -hmm. um, and yet has a kind of a, because it's because it's small. Entrepreneurs in Georgia are automatically building for the region, if not globally. Very mm. difficult to build a significant business. I mean, if you're going to build a significant business in a smaller market, you broadly have to do it in financial services uh, or have some angle with financial services. Georgia already has Bank of Georgia and TBC Bank that have been phenomenally successful, listed in London, essentially an oligopoly in, in that market, along with Liberty Bank and a couple of others. So very difficult to build a significant uh, technology company purely in Georgia. But but through that, I think that sort of international exposure a lot of people have had through the financial sector, as well as also sort of working abroad, uh, you get some very talented entrepreneurs that are building regionally and, and, and globally. Um, if you would say contrast that to the largest market we invest in, which is Pakistan, um, there you can build a significant business in a whole range of sort of smaller verticals and, and, and sectors. So broadly, people are building for Pakistan. Now, they might have ambitions to expand to Bangladesh, to uh, the, the Middle East. But that kind of size of market uh, and the, the local dynamics plays a very important part. Kazakhstan's an interesting one because population isn't huge, but 80, 18 million is sort of enough. I mean, you're very spread out in terms of what, maybe 5 million between Almaty and Astana. So she's getting 20 now. 
Okay, 20. Okay. Yeah. But say about five. It might, it might be even bigger next time you come here. Maybe. We are, we are, yeah, growing, uh, we are growing fast. Growing, growing fast. Uh, Actually, I, th I think the president is, is opening like a prenatal uh, kind of yeah. uh, 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 hospital for, okay. for uh, giving birth, which actually signifies sort of some demographic boom in, in the country. Oh, okay. yeah. well, that's, that, that's interesting, unlike anywhere in the West where we're just uh, sort of declining slowly. But, uh, but you, you, relative, like, it's not a huge consumer population. And you have um, Caspi. Really, it's it's incredibly difficult for anyone to compete in a, a, in a in a consumer facing business with Caspi because they own distribution. What is it? Six seven million daily active users, eight nine month eight nine million monthly active users. I know coming here now as a foreigner, you try and pay cash for something, and they look at you like you've got a disease. Like I don't want that. I don't have change. Can you not pay Caspi? And I'm like, no, no, I can't. I can't set it up without a local number and tax code or whatever. So. Um, they've been phenomenally successful in, in their IPO in London and the sort of the, the, the revenues that they generate. What it means, I, I think, if you look at uh, what they did in the travel space uh, after they bought Santa Fe and uh, when they launched it within the Caspi, uh, the Caspi ecosystem, they got to something like 30% market share in six months. And so that's what you're up against as a consumer facing business. So, so typically we see maybe some more B2B software. Uh, whether that's catering to enterprise customers or more to SMEs that seem to be coming from Kazakhstan. And actually, similarly, from Uzbekistan, it seems to be a fair a kind of consistent across Central Asia that uh, for whatever reason, there's um, an ability to build B2B software uh, solutions. Um, Uzbekistan, I think, has a bit more going for it on the consumer side, population nearly twice the size, and also there isn't that sort of dominant market player. Um, but from a technology adoption perspective, f further behind than Kazakhstan, which courtesy of Caspi is, is light years ahead of a lot of even, I mean, quite a few e European countries. Um, I suppose that the one that I haven't mentioned so far would be Bangladesh. And Bangladesh's biggest problem is that it, it doesn't come up on people's radar. So like if you're, if you're Pakistan, you kind of fall into the Middle East bucket. Middle East investors look at you, you're a big uh, addressable market. You're not friends with India, but that's fine. India sort of does its own thing. If you're Bangladesh, you're, you're not India. For some reason, you're not really Southeast Asia, but you're a country of 170 million people with a higher GDP per capita than, uh, than, um, than India. Uh, actually, it's a very small country, which has its challenges, but also in terms of logistics and moving things around, it's, it's pretty easy. One of the big textile, I guess, factories in the world. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they've built this uh, phenomenal success building a ready-made garments industry, now around $45 billion a year in exports. Um, so it, it's built a very kind of strong foundation uh, on the, in terms of the wider economy. Uh, in terms of the technology ecosystem, similar to Pakistan, it's, it's plenty big enough as a domestic market. But again, might be more similar, similar to Uzbekistan, the level of technology adoption and the sophistication of that technology adoption amongst the cons consumers and businesses is still pretty, pretty, pretty early stage. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You, um, any other geographies you invested? Did you, did you have any investments in Mongolia? Have you been there? We haven't made any investments there. Uh, the one thing I was going to say is like, it's funny, you go anywhere in the former Soviet Union and uh, there's always a building that you look at and you think that could be in any of the other countries that I've been to, the sort of uh, uh, Soviet style um, apartment blocks, which I was happy to see are also in Ulaanbaatar. In Mongolia as well? Yeah, exactly yeah, yeah, the yeah. same ones. Um, there, I mean, look, it's, it's, a, it's th three million people in mm -hmm. Mongolia, 90 million livestock. Mm -hmm. There's not much you can do really in, 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 in that market. I mean, the, the, if there is anyone with a sort of similar mentality to Georgia in terms of building something globally, but from just from even from a geographical perspective, you're not as well positioned as Georgia because you're a long way from Europe. You're still a long way from the US. It'd be difficult to sell into China or Russia. So um, I went there, there were some, a few interesting businesses. Um, a couple kind of stood out in particular, but broadly a challenging market to build something. I mean, you could probably build a business that for you as a founder, assuming you don't sell too much of the business along the way, you, you, it might be a nice exit for you. You might be, it might be a couple of million to a local conglomerate or a telco. Mm -hmm. and that could be life-changing money for you, but for us as, as a VC, it just doesn't really... Just move an eagle. Huh? Yeah, exactly. What about Kyrgyzstan? Any investments there? Uh, none, not, none so far. Uh, I've been there th three or four times, um, met some interesting businesses. Again, similar to Georgia, you're having to build regionally at least from day one or, or if, if, if not globally. 
Um, you have this interesting business there called um, uh, um, Grow Wave. I don't know if you've come across them. They're, they're sort of a, a Shopify app. Have built a very profitable, large business. I mean, we're talking hundred thousands of dollars in monthly revenue uh, entirely from Kyrgyzstan, serving an international client base. Um, they, they've, they've never need, they've never raised money. They've never needed to raise money. They're a good example of what you can do without actually needing, needing VC funding. Um, so there, there are a couple of companies there, but, uh, again, it really comes back to that. F what are we underwriting as an investor? What are we promising to our investors? And, mm -hmm. and really each investment, we, we don't make, Hundred tens or hundreds of investments from 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 our funds. Fund one made eighteen. Fund two, we expect to make fifteen to twenty. Um, the idea being that we we are more concentrated, but we really we bet bigger on the companies that we really believe in, um, and we are then we have the capacity to add value and 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 support them uh, post post investment through that local network as well as international as well as sort of cross uh, cross portfolio portfolio experience. Are you investing in sort of a Series A and C stage? Yeah, typi C? typically seed, but that's kind of post revenue, post product. Yeah. Uh, I'd say pre-series A is our kind of a. sweet spot. That's when we're, in terms of the kind of traction that businesses tend to have and valuation that we're kind of comfortable with. Uh, and series A, we do, we make a few investments, but the bar is higher because we have to invest more in the first round to build the uh, ownership that we want, as well as um, to kind of deploy the capital at a valuation, which we think will allow us to generate the returns uh, on a fund level that we're targeting. And uh, given like you, you made, you've made, given the fact that you've made 18 investments, I guess, 25 mil, from $25 million fund that comes to, uh, let's say one point, I guess, two or three uh, million per, per, per company. Um, and are you targeting 20% sort of allocation when you're no, uh, we're, we're typically targeting five, five to ten percent ownership. Got it. Um, but so from fund one, I'd say our our average initial check was probably three to five hundred k. Got it. Fund two is more sort of five hundred k to a million. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the, the 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 probably the median check size we have in uh, have have in any company is is somewhere between five hundred k and a million. Oh, so that means you haven't deployed your first fund fully yet. We're, we're nearly fully deployed, oh, it, but we are concentrated in a few, ah. uh, if you like, out, standout performers from, 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 from fund you one. You have some follow on investments. Exactly. In yeah. So if you look at fund two, broadly, the strategy is that uh, 40% of funds uh, are reserved for initial investments and 60% for follow ons. Ah, interesting. And what it, it's a very interesting strategy. You're not trying to sort of spray and pray very sort of a kind of a Warren Buffett approach to venture capital, I guess, mm -hmm. so to speak, sort of very concentrated, kind of like benchmark capital style, I would say. Right? Do you take a board seat as well? Uh, we do usually, yeah. Okay, got it. And that's very, very I guess, a sort of, um, uh, uh, it, it, indeed, indeed, very similar to benchmark. Benchmark At the moment, it seems like you have four genres of companies you like, right? FinTech, uh, 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 B2B, marketplaces, e-commerce, right? Uh, are you, that, does it mean that you are not you're going to sort of uh, ignore a company in a different space or what's no? It? So we we are um, we we have the capacity and the, the mandate to invest in in anything, um, but if you like those 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 areas that you highlighted, considering this this level of uh, digitalization and technology adoption in 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 these markets. You're still really building some of those initial kind of base layers of technology on which other products and services will be built down the line. Um, so broadly, when we think about sort of fintech infrastructure and, and lending businesses, uh, you're looking at the, I mean, the, the, the level of sort of credit card penetration in the markets we invest in tends to be sub 5%, usually sort of 1% to 2%. A uh, number of people that have bank accounts, usually sub 50%. Again, Kazakhstan and Georgia being outliers here compared to the other countries. So there's a lot that needs to be done at a very basic level before you get into the more maybe sophisticated products. Um, but for instance, we've just made a, an investment from Fund2 in an ed tech business in Bangladesh. Um, which I, I think is a very interesting space in, in, in that market. Uh, broadly, I think is a challenging one 
if you're trying to build a sort of a regional or global one from 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 a, from from these sort of markets, just because you're you're going up against some very well funded uh, and well built businesses globally. Um, but in Bangladesh, you have a kind of unique sort of dynamic in terms of local curriculum and, and language as well. Uh, but no, so we we do look at at, at anything and and, and everything, um, but it, uh, within the technology startup space. <laughs> Got it. How many deals do you look at per year as a firm? Um, so how many do I think? I th looked the other day. I think our uh, sort of CRM has around eight, nine hundred deals that we've looked at per year. Um, no, in, uh, that that that's in total. That's so this, this this is one of the challenges for these markets is there's not the volume of deal flow it's like well, roughly 300 per year or so let's say yeah, roughly roughly around that. But then what quite often happens is we've seen the deal. 18 months beforehand, they raised a sort of pre-seed round or a seed round. Now they've come back to try and raise uh, a round which is more suitable for us. Mm. So I think it's 80%, 80% of the investments we've made, we said no to the first time. Because it's, uh, I always try and say is it's, it's no for now, not forever. So right. you, you think like what you guys are doing, but you're too early or we have these questions around business model or... What do you want or, to see typically? Um, very often it's just like, look, we, nice idea what you guys are working on, but either you're not raising enough for us. Uh -huh. Like maybe if they're raising 500K and we're a 500K check, we don't want to be the only investor in the room. Mm -hmm. I don't think it helps anyone. Like if things are going badly, just being told off by one person, a bit of an, an um, antagonistic environment, more people around the table, I think always helps. Uh, so very often it's just that the round isn't big enough for us um, and or that they're still, maybe they've got a few customers and a thousand dollars in monthly revenue. It's very difficult to build conviction around that for us. So we're not an idea stage investor. For sure. We, we, we can get very enthusiastic about ideas um, and the founders and, and the team, but it's, it's usually a case of saying, look, really like what you guys are doing, but... Um, we just need to see more traction in terms of kind of, I don't know, it's like I was speaking to a business uh, this morning uh, out of Bangladesh that wants to target enterprise customers uh, with a kind of solution for employing blue collar workers uh, from more emerging markets and more developed markets. Like very, very interesting concept was essentially similar to deal, uh, but focused on blue collars uh, rather than white collar workers. And um, like, I like, like the idea, but they still haven't sold to an enterprise customer yet. Uh, and they still haven't actually fully built out their product. So I was like, look, raise what do you want to raise now? Which actually we could have, like a round size was probably enough, but look, it's not for us. Build out the product. Not saying you need to have 100 enterprise customers, but at least have a few so you, you, you have validated and we can validate that there is actually demand for the, for the, for the service that you're providing to them. And if, we were, if let's say, uh, let's say our company which got initial, initial rejection, uh, would you be open if I add you to my sort of uh, monthly updates and I, yeah I tell I, I try and tell everyone to do this and some people do them amazing and they don't like those monthly updates they don't need to be like five pages long they don't need to be a PDF attached to something if it's a PDF I'm probably not going to open it <laughs> it's just a few bullet points it's this is what went well this is maybe what didn't go well this is what we're working on at the moment this is something we could do with some help with, and these are our KPIs. Can you give some exact, uh, probably examples, particular cases that will be interesting for audience? In what, in terms of? In terms of uh, companies that you rejected the first time and then you accepted them. Um, so let me think. Uh, so uh, if we look at a um, uh, Ukrainian business we invested in, a business called PeopleForce, now they are an all-in-one HRM solution focused on white collar, uh, white collar SMEs, especially sort of IT companies. That's where they've, they've found their niche. Um, so they are, they first approached us at really what was a kind of pre-seed round. That was, I think, December of 2020. Uh, approached us then, really liked the founder, liked what he'd built. They had been running a, an, out, an outs outsourcing company before had built the solution to solve his own problems because he felt there wasn't anything on the market that really solved them for him, sold it to a few other out outsourcing companies, realized this was a 
better opportunity than the outsourcing. So closed that down and was had really just sort of refocused. And the traction was good. I mean, they were like month over month, they were doing well. We liked the product. Um, and like from a kind of from everything on that side, it was, but at that point, I think they were like 10K in monthly revenue. So we said, look, really like what you're doing. This round's not for us. Good luck raising it. And let's stay in touch. They got back in touch six months. He didn't do the monthly updates, which is was like whatever. Like they got back in touch six months later and said, "Look, this is what we've done. We raised money. We put more money in marketing and all, like sort of customer success, and we are now at forty k, fifty k in MRR. Maybe I think it may have been, even been a bit more. We're like, wow. Well, we we already kind of liked you before. You've gone away. You've built that traction. You've actually learned a lot. So we're kind of asking questions about well, you had these assumptions here and these things, and saying, okay, this turned out not to be right. We've really identified um, our uh, ideal uh, customer profile. These things, and so having those conversations as well helps because you can, like, I always make notes from every meeting that I have. So if I speak to someone again after six months, I'll just go through the notes and say, okay, so you were going to do this, this, this. They start talking and it say, well, okay, you told me you were going to do this. W- what happened? Uh-huh. Not like like it's blaming or saying like holding them like <laughs> just saying why why didn't it work out? My assumption is ninety percent of what you told me the first time won't happen for a bunch of reasons that are almost certainly nothing to do with you, but to do with everything else going on. But just to hear how people think about how the business has evolved. Uh, so they came back to us. People for us finished that story off. Came back six months later. Uh, and we invested uh, and led and led their next round. Our business has done phenomenally well since then, despite uh, despite the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, and and and, and every, the impact that's had on the business. Um, so I think that's a that's a very good example of one that went away. But that just that that monthly update. If any investor you meet, unless they explicitly tell you not, add them to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it doesn't matter kind of how you end up getting those kind of contact details. Add them to it and. I still read like there are some there are some businesses which we'll never invest in for whatever reason. I still got their monthly update. Like there's a, there's a, a company in um, Mexico that I got introduced to the founder by someone. He still sends me what they're doing. I still read the whole thing. I'm just interested in what's going on. And I think once or maybe twice he would put, "Oh, we're looking for help with this." It's like, "Oh, I know someone." And I, just because I'm not an investor doesn't mean I'm not going to help you out. Maybe at some point I will. Maybe something like I'm not doing it for. Kind of to 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 mean that you're you're in my debt. Just helpful. Like it's it's such an easy thing to do. So those monthly newsletters, uh, mon- monthly updates for investors. Anyone not doing them is is making a massive mistake. Especially at the moment when raising money is more difficult. If I meet you today and then you we don't speak for six months, and I've spoken to a few hundred companies between now and then, I'm not going to remember what you do, and it's not your fault. Like it's not, it's not your, well, it is your fault because you didn't tell me, but like, it's not because I don't care. It's just a lot of other people have pitched and presented things between now and then. Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's just sort of, I'll teach your competition kind of approach, right? You, you want to be sort of sharing your lessons along the way and, uh, uh, get, uh, potential investors along with you on this journey. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's really a journey. And then if they hop on, I mean, they're part of it, but they want to know more, right? They, it's just, uh, you, you never get married to just uh, like a first person you meet in a bar. You want to have a few dates and so you, sometimes you have dates for years. And yeah. uh, I guess it's a pretty similar relationship here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and like we, for us, we do the same with our own potential investors. So mm-hmm. fundraising at the moment, and we send out a monthly m- monthly update just on sort of, look, this is uh, like, if we've made a new investment from the fund, or if we tell them where we're going to be traveling, we tell them sort of uh, kind of any new pipeline ones, if there's an update on other investors who've committed to the fund, like where, where do we stand? And I don't know, maybe they read it, maybe they don't. But at least you're, you're hitting their inbox on a regular basis mm-hmm. so that when we get to that sort of point of saying, right, we're having a close now, they're not going, oh, we haven't spoken for six months. So, oh, yeah, I remember, okay, you did this, this, this. They've just got a, like that kind of reference point that's a bit fresher. Mm-hmm. You mentioned people for us. Um, what are some of the, um, I guess, themes you find in sort of Ukrainian companies you look at? Um, well, I, I think what's what's happened in Ukraine, you've seen it in, in other markets as well, is you, that's, that um, outsourcing kind of community that, that was built first, um, becoming that kind of that 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 hub for outsourcing out outstaffing, 
Uh, so very, very strong technical talent. Um, again, kind of courtesy of the, the university and uh, school system as well, being very strong in the STEM subjects. Um, but as those individuals worked with international companies, gained that experience, that understanding of what it means to be building kind of product for an international audience, uh, how to take, what it means to be running and working in a startup, kind of the natural progression is those people then going like people force exactly from outsourcing to building their own product, usually alongside with the outsourcing business still going because it's a nice cash cow, reinvesting and then ultimately getting to the point of of, of scaling. Mm-hmm. I mean, so we have two investments there and I know quite a few other founders there. I mean, one thing that almost universally across the board they have demonstrated is a tenacity and a um, a, a the, the the refusal to give up in the face of everything that's happened in the last 15, 16 months. Mm-hmm. Um, so take people force, for example, we, uh, the day Russia invaded, we were due to sign uh, documents for another investor to come in uh, with around another, uh, another million dollars. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously that fell through. Uh, founders if they're wanting to worry about all his own team, are they safe? Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Uh, 20% of the customer base was in Russia. What do you do about that? 80, 75% of the customer base is in Ukraine. Are they still going to be operating? Is there going to be a business left? And he, he admitted to me, I saw him about a month afterwards um, outside of Ukraine. He said, yeah, for like three days, I just didn't know what to do. Like everything seemed to have gone wrong. And he thought, actually, no, screw it. Like I'm not going to let I'm not going to let this go down because because of what's happened. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I'm going to work 16-hour days, and I'm going to make sure my team's safe, and then I'm going to make sure my customers are okay, and then I'm going to keep building this product. And similarly, another business, uh, FinMap, that we're investors in there, uh, one of the co-founders was actually called up to the Ukrainian army, uh, was wounded on the front line, is still fighting now. The other co-founder has sort of taken on that additional responsibility, managed to raise money from international investors, take care of the team, keep growing the business despite everything. And it's they've remarkable. They've set a very high bar for what I will accept from founders as being a legi- legitimate excuse for not being able to solve problems. Yeah, it's like no why has your has your country been invaded uh, by another force and all these things? No, just sort it out then. Like you didn't, you don't sign up for this job if you want a kind of a nice, easy life. If you do, then you're, you're making a mistake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's actually an interesting point that uh, you, you made about sort of a lot of product companies in, in Ukraine being sort of former outsourcing companies. And that's actually uh, explains why most of those product companies are enterprise SaaS, sort of B2B mm. SaaS, because they're already comfortable serving companies. Yeah. So now they, instead of serving having a custom product just for one company, we'll have a, a single product for thousands of companies, which actually makes sense, makes it more scalable. Uh, uh, do you find with this, the, um, that the sort of the creating companies you looked at or you talked to, they have Salesforce on the ground in the US or they actually sell from, from Ukraine? Uh, broadly, I mean, this, I think, so if I were to draw a comparison between, say, it's the kind of uh, Central Asian businesses that I've seen try to go to the US, everyone underestimates how difficult it's going to be, how expensive it's going to be. And despite that sort of allure of being such a large, large market, which it is, and despite there being so much VC funding available, mm-hmm. the competition is totally different. The consumer and sort of business behavior is totally different. So I think broadly the ones that have been successful have been able to establish that on the ground presence, whether that's a co-founder kind of moving there, basing themselves there, hiring the team. And you've seen some that companies have been built that haven't had so much of an on the ground presence, but it's very difficult to understand your end user Mm-hmm. when you are coming from a very different culture and and and, and uh, society and, and that I think broadly the ones that, that have been successful have had some kind of on the ground presence or have had been operating maybe in a space where you have um, something that binds you together beyond that is sort of beyond your kind of national sort of sense whether that's I mean, particularly sort of uh, products and services for uh, um, uh, developers 
where sort of developers globally, that, that is something that can kind of bind you together beyond being an American developer or a Ukrainian developer, because you're not working in English or Ukrainian or, or Russian or whatever, you're working in, in Python or, or whatever, whatever the language is that you're using um, then, then and there. So I think that you've seen quite a few companies that have, that have managed that, but broadly, yeah, it's, it is more difficult than most people think it's going to be, uh, and it costs a lot more money than they think it's going to that it's going to be. And most I've seen have ended up kind of you get the first couple of customers, mm-hmm. oh, this is working, and then realize that actually that's not the product market fit that they thought it was. Got it. And so the Ukrainian companies you found that they primarily focus on local market and European markets. So yes, that's I guess the kind of the thing for us is almost all the companies we invest in are focused on emerging markets. Got it. So solving problems for emerging markets. Now we, we have done and we, we will do a few investments where it's founders from emerging markets building more for developed markets. Mm-hmm. But when I, I mentioned earlier is like we, we want to and we try to and I think we do add value for our portfolio companies. But where that is, is really our experience in emerging markets, our on the ground presence, our networks. Mm-hmm. If you're going to the US, Mm-hmm. I mean, I can wish you all the luck in the world and I can maybe introduce you to a couple of people, mm-hmm. but I, I don't, we don't have that same ability to add value. So it's, it's also becomes more difficult for us to build conviction around an investment if we don't understand the market they're going to be operating in. Mm-hmm. So broadly, even I think of a company that we're, we're, we're looking at at the moment where a uh, sort of emerging market founder that will, has a target market, which is in more developed markets but is also doing emerging markets. And there is the opportunity set in both is large. I think it kind of it's, it's nice to have both options. And so we can kind of, we can underwrite that risk. Mm-hmm. I think there are a few, few more regions I would love to touch on. Sort of, do you have any investments in Egypt? We have two investments in Egypt. Yeah. Sort of, what, what is it uh, sort of, what is it like to build a startup in Egypt? Like, um, so e- Egypt is, Actually, in terms of technology adoption, I think f- further ahead than Pakistan or uh, um, Bangladesh, you have uh, kind of a high level of education broadly across uh, uh, across the country. Um, e- Egypt, Egypt has been a kind of an intellectual center within the Arabic world for for for, for hundreds of years, mm-hmm. um, and so you have that, a lot of talent, particularly kind of uh, um, IT uh, and, and and tech talent in the country. The difficulty historically has been keeping it in Egypt rather than it going to Europe or the US. Mm. But increasingly people are staying. And and the sort of the startup ecosystem kick started a little bit earlier. So maybe two or three years earlier. And so it is two or three years ahead in terms of the sophistication of some of the companies as well as the founders. You have a strong diaspora um, that more of them are coming back having worked in the US or, or, or Europe. So all of these things kind of work in work in your favor. You also broadly your addressable market is uh, is fairly concentrated in the north of north north of Egypt, sort of around Cairo and then up 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 uh, up the Nile the Nile Delta. Um, so logistically not terrible, and you have a large hundred and hundred and ten million uh, person market. On the flip side, from a macro perspective, uh, economically not in a very strong position at the moment. Uh, currency is devalued from around thirteen fourteen pounds to around around forty five pounds to the dollar. So kind of big headwinds there. It's the re- reasons being some kind of more global, importing a lot of their grain from Ukraine and Russia. So that had a big impact, but also subsidies in places where maybe they shouldn't they shouldn't be to the same extent. Um, and that's creating quite a headwind for the country. The interesting thing is, is Egypt is, uh, you look at Saudi Arabia at the moment, huge amounts of VC funding going in, but the addressable market domestically is still relatively limited. Egypt is sort of the most natural expansion for a lot of Saudi companies or a lot of Egyptian companies are now trying to go to Saudi so they can sell themselves as a Saudi company, raise Saudi money and then build elsewhere as well. So that kind of interaction, what we've seen is Egypt of all the markets we invest in, valuations haven't corrected in the same way as they have globally or or anywhere else. They're still high. They're still high. Like we see... We're looking at a deal which was effectively pre-seed raising 8 million at a 40 million post money valuation. Now, okay, it gave them like 36 months runway, but growing into that valuation, incredibly difficult. And so broadly, I mean, we, we've, we've made a couple of investments there from our previous fund, now not really so actively looking at it, um, given 
I think a combination of the macro dynamics and also the, the, the kind of valuation uh, expectations uh, on the ground at the moment. Deals I'd look at in Central Asia with better traction and I think sort of similar opportunities uh, at 25% of the valuation. It's not, it's a bit of a no-brainer really. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What about Middle East? You Mid- mentioned Saudi Arabia, yeah. you, have, you, you have a few investments, I guess, in UAE. We have one investment headquartered out of UAE, but it's very much a globally focused uh, startup. Um, if, if Egypt has high valuations, Saudi has, I mean, they're, they're stratospheric. I, I, I still haven't spent time on the ground in Saudi, so I, I'm not as informed as would I would like, like, would, would like, like to Would you like to? Be. I, I want to see what's going on. I want to yeah. see like everyone I speak to says it's it's real. It is what what they what, want to beat the U.S. Every- in terms of the amount of venture capital per capita. <laughs> well, this I mean I don't think they'll be far off that soon. But yeah. the 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 thing I see there, and it's an interesting question as an investor. It's like you think, okay, the real addressable market is not that big, but you have a lot of government money. Mm-hmm. and a lot of private money with government encouragement that's flowing into VC. So it's pumping up valuations at an, at an early stage at pre-seed, seed, series A. But what you also have is these large government funds that can write 50 100 to $100 million checks at series B, series C. You also have the government that said it wants to have 10 unicorns by 2030. So what I see is this dynamic where the government wants to have 10 unicorns, the government's also pumping a bunch of money in. So the government will create 10 unicorns. Should they be worth that much money on a really kind of fundamental level? Maybe not. But I think what will then happen as well is the government wants to develop its local stock exchange. So those companies will be encouraged to IPO locally. Local public market investors will be encouraged, usually with some government money maybe involved as well, to then be investing in those stocks. So if I'm thinking about it as an investor and I'm thinking, well, okay, it's, the valuation seems crazy, but actually maybe my path to exit in a, at a valuation that might actually deliver me returns is there. So I mean, we, we haven't done anything in Saudi. I don't think we will do anything in Saudi because we don't have that kind of on the ground presence and understanding of the market. But it's an interesting kind of question to ask yourself as an investor is, I mean, you might, the company might look like there's, like there's nothing there and that it's all a kind of a, a facade, but if there's enough money at every step of the way to maintain that facade, you just have to not be the last one standing, standing, holding or stand, 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 standing, holding the chair when, when, when the music turns off. Interesting. So they want to build 10 unicorns by 2030. Yep. And this is Saudi. Saudi companies based in Saudi with Saudi talent, but operating in, I don't know, in bigger markets or uh, serving the local, local audiences. So I think with the idea that they would be expanding GCC and then maybe across sort of Middle East, Africa, sure. Pakistan is a market that a lot of them look at as sort of the opportunity to scale. Got it. So they want more Kareem, so to speak, right? Just kind of like, yeah, got it. Interesting. And, uh, uh, huh. And so they are not happy being LPs into vision funds and kind of uh, no longer. And, <laughs> no. and this and the the interesting dynamic if you're a f- if you're a fund raising money at the moment, the only place in the world that has more money than it did 12, 18 months ago is the GCC basically. Mm-hmm. So everyone's going there. Whether you're doing US sort of AI investing or Sturgeon Capital doing sort of emerging market uh, frontier market things. Um, so there's everyone's going there and, and a lot of those LPs, particularly kind of family offices, want to see that you're investing in Saudi. I think partly so that they can sort of pass it around and up the food chain that they're investing in funds doing that. The interesting dynamic is actually when we speak to investors, a lot of them find it quite refreshing that we're not doing GCC, we're not doing sort of US, we're not sort of doing AI or whatever. We're actually doing something a bit differentiated. Mm-hmm. And again, as it kind of I said earlier, like we're not... We're not pitching them for the sort of to be their largest allocation to VC, but actually as something that that is differentiated and and decorrelated. I think in a way, uh, it's it's a niche that we can p- pitch ourselves in quite quite well. I think that explains why there are so many American investors sort of frequenting Riyadh, uh, like <laughs> this. Days. And they're not just doing it from <laughs> from the good of their hearts. Yeah, it's uh, not for touristic reasons. Yeah, yeah. and I, I mean they've got the traditional LPs they may have worked with in the US 
have now got this issue where public markets have come down, but mm. VCs aren't particularly quick to revalue their portfolio down if they can avoid it. Uh, particularly as everyone, we see a lot of this kind of round structuring with liquidation preferences to keep the nominal valuation at a certain level means VCs haven't devalued. So these 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 uh, these LPs in the US don't have the capacity to allocate what they might have done before. Uh, and everyone, I mean, people raised crazy large funds and deployed them at crazy high speeds in 2021, 2020, 2020 till 2022. So these LPs are a bit kind of tapped out. So they, they've got to go somewhere else to try and find money to raise raise the next one. Are you pitching to any Sa- Saudi uh, sort of family offices? Have you? So we've been speaking to a few in in Saudi and in uh, the UAE as well. When you when you make your pitch to family offices, be it in Saudi, be it in Europe or elsewhere, what is your pitch like? Um, I mean, I guess is that sort of uh, broadly kind of summarizing what we see as the opportunity set mm-hmm. uh, in that context of the sort of VC funding per capita, this idea of these markets being primed for to follow in the path of other emerging markets. Because I think that's, if you just try and pitch the opportunity on its own, and this is similar, I think, for startups as well. If you just try and pitch your what you're trying to do in isolation, no matter how much, obviously, you think it's a good idea, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. But if you don't provide the context and, and put it in the sort of broader picture, it's very difficult for people to contextualize and understand it. So if we if we think about kind of our, our markets, it's saying, look, you've seen this digitalization across other emerging markets over the last 15, 20 years. China being the first, followed by India, followed by Indonesia, followed by Brazil and LATAM, increasingly by other Southeast Asian countries. Um, you've seen it happening in, in countries like Turkey, for example. Um, and what, is, what has happened as, as that happened? Okay, as, as VC funding has flowed in, both domestic and international, uh, it's unlocked this sort of startup activity. They have built meaningful businesses solving some of these fundamental problems. Uh, and those those meaningful businesses have ended up generating significant returns for those early investors. Now, we think and we believe, uh, and I'm pretty confident that the markets we're investing in are, are at that same early stage and that therefore we're in that similar position. So we're not just coming in and saying, come, come invest in Uzbekistan, because most people are like, I haven't really heard of that. Like, where is it? Like, where, what are you talking about? Or Pakistan, they get kind of, like, they don't understand it. So it's, a lot of it is around that contextualizing it and really sh- demonstrating this is an opportunity to generate kind of those, those outsized risk adjusted returns in a, in a decorrelated fashion from their allocation to the US VCs and maybe the GCC VCs or European ones as well. Mm-hmm. What, what is the typical, um, allocation those a typical family office sort of have uh, has for venture capital let's say it's some some kind of mixed public stocks real estate is it 10 percent venture capital five percent venture capital so i think of one that uh, i saw the other day in dubai i mean they're probably at around they think they're looking to deploy maybe four 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 to five percent four to five percent in 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 in, in venture venture, uh, venture total yeah. and and then emerging markets would be like, I don't know, like 1%? Um, I mean, probably, yeah, of, of that money, it's it's probably 10 to 20% of, of, that, of, of, that, of that 45%. And the rest would yeah. be? Uh, developed markets, developed if they're markets. in the GCC, then it's typically a lot of it focused on the sort of local market, uh, on the GCC market. But yeah, I think that's that's broadly around it. But I mean, typically, the sort of size of family office we're speaking to are allocating 1 to 2 million per fund. Mm-hmm. Is broadly, and they're not usually looking at many, like there aren't really any other funds that do what we do in terms of our markets. There are other funds that do Africa maybe or LATAM or Southeast Asia. So that's sort of kind of broadly the bucket that we're, I think we're, we're falling into. What's the funnel like? Like, let's say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sort of venture firm focusing on emerging markets. I'm targeting uh, to raise 50 million. So let's say I have to, that means I have to sort of uh, uh, have 25 to 50 LPs with 1 million, 1 to 2 million per each. Uh, uh, to get 25 to 50 L, uh, sort of family offices on board, how many do I have to pitch to? 500? 1,000? <laughs> what's um, the conversion like? Conversion is probably 1 to 2%. 1 to 2% crazy. Yeah. So I have to basically to get... 20- so this, I mean, this kind of depends like how you want to go about raising it. So I'd say we have three buckets of investors. Uh-huh. Um, 
we have those family offices that are doing anywhere, it's a 500K to 2 million, uh, depending on their size. You then have high net worth individuals that are doing anything from, I mean, in Fund One, we had some kind of 20, 50K checks up to maybe 200K um, as sort of in individuals with, who've made money doing, doing whatever. And then you have the more institutional bucket. And that kind of is probably broken down into two as well. So particularly given our focus on emerging markets and, and on being both a for-profit and for-impact investor, we are kind of naturally aligned with a lot of the development institutions, the mm -hmm. likes of the IFC, EBRD, ADB. So those institutions are kind of, if you like, natural L potential LPs for our funds. Now, building relationships with them takes time. So we've spent three to the last three or four years building relationships with those institutions. And only now on what is our second fund and with the track record that we have, are you getting to, to a, a, a viable position to raise money from them? Now they are, they are fantastic LPs given their kind of uh, exposure to these markets. Also their, their ongoing mandate to allocate. So if you can win them over for one fund, they'll almost certainly come in on the next fund as well. Uh, they take a long time to get comfortable with you, certainly a lot longer than we do to get comfortable with startups. But once they are comfortable, they make, they, they make a fantastic LP base. And then the other is perhaps the more return driven institutional base. So that could be, I mean, the, the dream of the sort of foundations and the endowments in the US that usually have an allocation to emerging markets. Again, building a relationship with them takes time. You also have perhaps the, the, the more sort of fund of fund type type investors uh, who, who will be allocating sort of globally and are really driven almost entirely by returns as well as sort of looking for some kind of uh, decorrelation if they can find it. Um, so that's the sort of investor base we're, we're speaking to now. How you, how you access that investor base is, is different. The sort of the endowments, you sort of, well, you want that kind of personal, <laughs> personal connection, that personal introduction, the high net worths. It's where we do quite a lot of podcasts. Uh, we just did one on, uh, the, um, uh, capital allocators. Kian did one uh, that came out last week. Um, and that's, that's one which is uh, more kind of broad brush, try and get ourselves in front of as many high net worths and some might find it interesting. You have a call and maybe it's a hundred K check. Interesting. Uh, but it's similarly conversion rates there are, are pretty low, pretty low as well. If you were to raise a $50 million fund, what would be your sort of LP base? Would it be like 50% institutions, 25% uh, sort of high net network of individuals and 25% sort of the family offices or 25, 25, 50, or what would be a sort of a um, more realistic mix? So looking at our current fund at the moment, um, 10, 10, 80, maybe. I think we'll, oh, so I, ideally we'd, we'd like it to be maybe 80% 80, 80 institutional or 70, yeah, yeah. 80% institutional Makes where you're, you're dealing with a smaller Fewer. number of investors, yeah. more professional investors where the questions are, are difficult, but they're very kind of, I think they're good questions to be asked. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you always want to have the space for those kind of high net worths, people who've made money in these markets or just really passionate about them. I'd like to be able to generate returns for them as well. And family offices, similarly, I mean, they, they, their ticket doesn't necessarily scale. They might be one to 2 million in this fund. They might be two to three in the next one, depending on the performance you deliver for them. Uh, but really longer term, it's building that, that institutional base. This fund, I mean, based on the kind of current pipeline, if we be somewhere between sort of maybe 50, around 50% institutional, mm -hmm. maybe 30% um, uh, family office and 20% high net worth. That makes sense. If we have a few, let's say, family offices or sort of HNPs uh, uh, watching this podcast, what would be the minimum check uh, for them to invest in? So high, 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 high net worths uh, or the sort of non-institutional is sort of, uh, I think around one, one to 200K. I, I can't remember exactly where it, where it sits at the moment. Um, institutional is sort of kind of 500K upwards, but Got it. I think what we're also flexible in, look, we, similar, similarly to how we interact with founders and startups in that it's not just we give you money once and then we never see, see you again. Uh -huh. With our own LPs is, look, if, if you're, if typically you invest 2 million in funds that you know well and you have a, a track record and experience with, we're not going to ask you to do the same thing with a fund that you've just met for the first time. Correct. So we have the flexibility to say, okay, 
we appreciate that kind of longer term with like you're you're the sort of investor that we want to work with so we're happy like making it a smaller check now you can kind of come inside you can see how we work you can get those those quarterly in-depth investor updates you can see the portfolio companies we're making the advantage we have is we probably won't do everything in a first close it'll be two maybe even three closes so maybe do a little bit now mm. maybe you can kind of top up a bit later on so, so there's a way to sort of invest 100 to 200k in tranches to get sort of to know each other better yeah so to try and yeah to try and to be flexible and accommodate um how people what, what people's capacity is and and how much exposure they want to take incredible and they have to go through I assume some KYC and AML. Yeah. yeah, so we 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 have our own uh, third party uh, fund administrator and board uh, who have a kind of standardized KYC and due diligence uh, AML um, process for all for all of the investors. Gotcha. Let's talk about the benefits you have by operating in in, in the emerging markets. I guess one of the benefits, sort of, I remember talking to you for the first time in the fall of twenty twenty. When you before, I guess your trip to Almaty, or during one of those trips. I think I, it, I think it might have been. Uh, well, 2020. No, I didn't travel in 2020 because okay, of COVID. So, so it must so, have been. Yeah, it must yeah have been you, you might have been in London. Yeah, I remember. I was outside. Just I was. Um, I locked myself for like six to eight, six to nine months. I I, remember I was sort of a living uh, uh, in 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 a uh, sort of a uh, uh, just taking a walk in the garden and then had a conversation with yourself. And what I think one of the benefits of emerging markets like Kazakhstan is the fact that you can see 100% of the deals. Is, is, is like, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you think it's actually the case? You can potentially invest in any company you want. Yeah. Is, is it um, true, true or not? Yeah, no, that, that is, that, I think that broadly is, is true. I, I mean, if we're not seeing 100% of the deals, then we're, we're, we're not doing something right. Because as I said, there aren't, there aren't hundreds of deals in each country. Now there are some that will be kind of too small and maybe haven't come up on our radar, but really it's our job to make sure that we're, we're either finding them through our network or if someone is like, what, what, what do we want to be? We want to be that sort of first choice mm -hmm. investor. If someone is raising money in our markets. Do you lead, do you lead rounds typically? We typically lead because yeah. there usually isn't someone else that has the capacity to, to, to lead sense. or the willingness. I mean, if, what we're, if we're trying to bring in international investors, and they say, well, I haven't done a deal in Central Asia before. It's like, okay, don't worry about leading and what the, the implications of that for you as an investor. We'll, we'll take on take on that responsibility. Um, and that's, uh, so typically we lead, but we've also co-led, we followed, we're flexible when it comes to that. But yeah, to come back to your point, if we're not seeing all the deals then we're not doing something right. This is so different than, than let's say, uh, I don't know, uh, United States, let's say. Like, mm. Uh, you you never see all the deals. You no. fight for them, and, and and it's it's so. You now, like the more I talk to you, the more I sort of realize how genius this sort of uh, the, the this thesis is. Just zig when everyone is zagging. I don't know, like the, the, so there's so many firms sort of operating in the U.S. market. Yeah, Sand Hill Road just full of firms and, and uh, uh, startups fighting for for this money very uh, super highly competitive vcs fighting for the money from lps extremely yep. competitive uh, very very difficult to differentiate yourself to either of your stakeholders and that's the interesting thing as a mm -hmm. vc is you you do have those two stakeholders and you you, you thinking about your funders as, as a product that makes sure it adds value to both of those stakeholders um and so understanding what it is that they what, what it is that they need and how you can kind of fulfill those needs and and sometimes they pull in different different directions. I mean, especially if kind of one investor has a certain mandate in terms of countries that doesn't line up with yours, and so you're trying to to, to balance the two. Um, it, it, it makes fundraising and, and operating and, and putting together those products uh, a very interesting thing to do mm. and and difficult. But Let's talk about the risks. So we discussed the benefits. Yeah. What are some of the risks of operating in these markets? So I think a, a risk historically, and I don't think it's true now, is was kind of being too early in some of these markets. So I think there were a, a few investors in sort of Bangladesh and Pakistan more so who were uh, a, a little bit early in terms of when they started investing. They made good investments, but it's taking a long time. And if you're a, a VC with a 10-year fund life, you, you, you do have, there is a clock ticking and it doesn't tick very loudly for the first three or four years, but by year seven or eight, 
it's ticking with a few questions behind it as well. So, <laughs> so that that market timing, like being right at the wrong time, is 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 as bad as just being wrong. Um, so, I, but looking at where these markets are, and it's that sort of VC funding per capita, it's technology adoption, it's internet penetration. Do feel that that's a risk which isn't true today for our markets. Um, one which I see you've kind of scribbled scribbled down there is the exit question. Um, and I think there's two, there's two parts of that. One is who are you exiting to? Who really are, who are they going to be the strategic acquirers or the, the, uh, listing opportunities for companies from this region to, to actually meaningfully exit to. And, um, if we think about the kind of strategic acquirers, historically, you look at a lot of, if we're thinking about Central Asia, a lot of the Russian technology companies saying this is a kind of natural extension of the markets they operate in. If you could build a presence there, you had the opportunity to be acquired by one of them. That's now much more difficult if you want to raise money from non-Russian investors. Um, so that window is being, being closed a bit. Um, I think what's sort of interesting is we've seen the recent case of uh, PayMe in, uh, in, um, in Uzbekistan which was originally, so TBC Bank uh, from Georgia invested in PayMe uh, originally back in, I think 2018 or 2019. Uh, they invested $5 million for roughly 50% of that business. Since then it has performed exceptionally well and they recently bought the other 50% at an implied valuation of around 120 million. Um, but what's kind of interesting, so that's, that's one example from the region that was kind of clear strategic value for the acquirer that was at, happened in this case was another regional investor. Um, there's, a, there's another business that we point to, which is a business called Cloudways in uh, um, out of uh, Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan sort of headquartered, but global client base, sort of uh, cloud, cloud architecture type uh, solutions. Um, they were acquired for 350 million uh, last year. Um, that was a business which had over nine years without raising any money scaled to $50 million in revenue. With which country is it? Uh, Pakistan. Pakistan. Uh, $50 million in revenue with around 30% net, net income margins. So phenomenally successful and so acquired for $350 million. Who now, was the buyer? Uh, the buyer was actually, it was a, 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 a dig, digital ocean, which is another kind of cloud, uh, cloud, cloud service provider. Um, so there, there were obvious uh, um, uh, synergies between the two businesses. They already worked closely together. What I think is interesting, and this comes on to my next point, is even if you found those acquirers, what is the sort of price that they're willing to pay? And in both of these cases, clear strategic value for the acquirer. So if you like a kind of potential premium that, that would be applied to any sort of valuation metric. But if you look at both companies in terms of their uh, revenue multiple, both of them had similar sort of levels of profitability, but if we use revenue, you're looking at a roughly a seven to eight times revenue, and this is pure revenue. It's no GMV, none of this stuff. It's pure. It's pure revenue. I think if we take five x as the sort of maybe expected or sort of base base case, you're saying okay, if if you can scale to fifty million dollars in revenue, you you're probably going to be worth in the region of let's say let's say two hundred to five hundred million, depending on margins and acquirer dynamics and this sort of thing. So then if actually what I work back on, and then this is, I think, one of the other sort of challenging things is, well, how do I price my funding rounds accordingly prior to that? How do I price my pre-seed or seed round such that as an investor in that round, I can generate the returns that I'm looking for? And my return expectations are higher the earlier I come in because the smaller check I'm putting in. So if I'm putting 200K in as a pre-seed investor, 10X, doesn't really push the needle. I, I'm looking at sort of 50 to 50 to 100 X to make a, a difference on the fund level. I'm coming in at series A, maybe I'm looking for 10 X because I'm putting in a bigger check. And I think if you're, if a company is trying to price its series A at a hundred million, it's going to be very difficult unless you can break out beyond, I think that sort of strategic acquirer point into either a more of a merger type thing with a really large regional or global player or pursue an IPO independently, it's going to be very difficult for you to make your Series A, or let alone your Series B investors, um, happy. And it's this, this idea of kind of each round, you whatever your previous round valuation was, that sets your minimum viable exit valuation. 
that will make your investors happy and will kind of, if you make your investors happy, you want to be a serial entrepreneur, that's how you're going to raise money going forward. So trying to really what we spend a lot of time doing is, is thinking about valuations in that context. And some businesses are different. Some businesses are either this is not going to work out at all, or we believe this can be a billion dollar plus plus company. And the valuation dynamics there are a bit different. But broadly, most companies are going to fall into that strategic thing. And maybe valuation metrics will increase over time. Maybe it'll be, it'll be closer to 500 and things can be priced accordingly. But I think particularly at that series A stage, while it might seem like it's not a big difference between the 30 or 40 million valuation, suddenly if you're saying you're off, like your series A investors are expecting 10x, you know, well, di difference between 300 and 400 million as an exit valuation, like that, that is hugely significant. That's what another, uh, what are we saying there? Another 10 to 20 million in revenue you've got to generate in order to, to deliver the returns that that investor is expecting. Um, so it, that it's, it's a challenge anywhere pricing things uh, accordingly, but pricing things for these region and having them have a conversation with founders to say, look, I know the European equivalent raised at this valuation. First of all, the amount of money a startup has raised is not a good indicator for the quality of that startup. Mm -hmm. But setting that aside, you cannot draw comparisons with European or US or even Indian companies where the supply of capital is different and the exit multiples are different and the path to exit is clearer. So things have to be, you have to price it for the reality of the market you're operating in. And, and it might suck. Mm -hmm. Like it, 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 it's not, it would be better if everyone was on playing on the same field, but we're, we're, we're not. And you can still deliver, make good money for yourself as well as for your investors and ultimately get to the point where you can exit a business and keep everyone happy. But you can't, you got to make sure you price things accordingly at the early stage. Now, this is a remarkable kind of point. Um, it actually reminds me of a, sort of a story I heard back in 21 at the sort of peak of the sort of a zero interest rate. Yeah. Craze. Uh, there was a company in the U.S. raising at a billion dollar valuation pre-product, uh, and and, the, and one of the investors who was pitched on the on the company. I don't know. I don't actually know what the company was. Uh, uh, he was like, he was telling to the founder, "Hey, do you actually know how venture capital works? If I invest in you at a billion dollar valuation." to make any meaningful return, you have to be the next Google. You have to be the next Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> like how likely are you? Like you have to be a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah. Otherwise I'm not going to, I mean, I'm, I just, there is no point in, in making this investment at all. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, 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 it is, is crazy when you, when you think about it like that um, and how difficult it is to generate returns. And then you end up in the situation like now where investors are, constructing rounds with these sort of liquidation preferences and things to keep valuations at the same level, but really they're just screwing, screwing the founder. Mm -hmm. like the founder is going to be the one who that business might, might have a good exit and they walk away with like 20 million. Mm -hmm. So, but they should have been walking away with maybe hundreds of millions, Correct. but because they got kind of carried away when times were good mm -hmm. um, and have then sort of get, you get, you get caught out later down the line. Let's talk. Let's let's say let's say let's kind of move this discussion and for kind of kind of apply it to to Kazakhstani market. So, uh, uh, listing is very unlikely. Let's just move it like put it aside. I think being acquired by strategic uh, uh, sort of uh, by strategic buyer very likely it happened before. Yeah, there are few of them. I mean, Big banks like Caspi and Freedom, yeah. Freedom Holding, yeah. being a few of them. Uh, um, hopefully, Halik will sort of start doing some acquisitions in the in the in the space as well. Being acquired by an international player hasn't happened yet. Mm. Who knows? Maybe it's it might happen in the future. Let's uh, let's sort of kind of discuss the next ten years. Sort of if if I'm an investor, if I'm venture capitalist, it sort of is. Most likely, and I guess the most optimistic scenario for a Kazakhstani company is a sort of exit at a fifty million dollar valuation, hundred million dollar valuation. What's what's sort of a realistic scenario? When is I, when this I'm, is this as a purely Kazakh? Yeah, let's company. say let's say a Kazakh Kazakh company focusing on a Kazakh market. Let's just make it simple. Okay, because I mean, I guess to put the context around it, we 
when we look at sort of Kazakh or Uzbek businesses, we look at them as Central Asian businesses. Got it. So they, they should have, they have to expand. They should at, at okay. least be covering Central Asia okay, and let's the Caucasus. Because then, th then you're looking at nearly 100 million people ah. as the addressable market. You're looking at a far more significant GDP addressable market. And Let's do that. Let's say it's yeah. a Kazakhstan company yeah. which found product market fit here and expanding to Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and so forth. Yeah. Um, so I think once you once you move beyond being single country, you open up, you significantly increase the the opportunity for an international or sort of non-Central Asian acquirer to come in. As you say, if you're if you're a Kazakh company, we've seen these examples of uh, whether it was um, uh, Santa Fe being bought by Caspi. Mm -hmm. um, like they, they don't pay a great price. Yes. Because they kind of know there's not really many other buyers. And, and this, I think, has to be the question of, well, for whoever is buying you, why are they buying you? Like, what is the real value in it? And I think if it's if it's purely that you you have a bit of sort of tech which they would like and they can't really they don't really want to build themselves, then then that's not going to be a huge valuation. However, if it's you've built yourself into being the kind of a, a, a dominant market position in a particular vertical for which there are comparable businesses internationally for whom it would make strategic sense to look at Central Asia. It could be logistics, it could be financial services, it could be healthcare related, ed education related. I think it can be broadly true across, across any of these. If, you've, if you have built yourself into being that regional leader, that, that, that dominant market player, I mean, you probably are going to have to be number one. There might be a, like other local players in each country, but to be attractive to an international player, you've got to, I think you've got to be more, 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 more regional. Um, unless, as like, like in the case of Pay Me, there's a real strategic value and a, and a big enough market presence in a single country. I, I think in that case, then, then, assuming again, you can, if you can get to $50 million in, Annual, annual revenue. And I mean like pure, pure revenue. And we're talking about software companies here. So really kind of software based 40 to $50 million in revenue. Then I think that sort of two to three, 400 million exit valuation is, is, is achievable. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also something that you kind of from, from, from day one, what are you trying to build with your business? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If it's one that, yeah, you want to build to a significant size, raise VC funding and exit and make everyone happy, then you should probably be thinking, well, why, why would someone buy me? What is it that I'm giving them? Distribution? Is it revenue? Is it product as well? What is it? Like, why, why are they going to pay a premium? Why are they going to pay any money at all? And why might they pay a premium for me? Uh, I think if you can articulate that, if, even at, at an early stage, it gives investors a lot of confidence to say, well, okay, there's execution risk between here and here and that point. But if we believe that that execution risk is qu mitigated by the quality of the founder, then investing then becomes, you're lowering that hurdle for someone to commit and say yes. Got it. And so if we were to kind of, if we stick to this sort of genre of the company, sort of focusing on Central Asian market, that sort of means that as an early, as an early stage investor, investing at a an valuation beyond 10 million is a no-go. I mean, it doesn't make sense because my, As a, I guess it depends on it depends on your check size. That's a good point too. So, so yeah, let's say let's say that the check well the check size is five hundred k or so. So uh, have to be super early. Yeah, and, I, th I think if you're going sub five hundred k, yeah, you really want to be coming in at, at below ten million. Below ten. Yeah. It's when you sort of like if if we look at ours. So if we take our our fund size, let's call it sort of forty million. Now, we typically invest say 500k to a million as our first check but we're going to follow on after that so what will actually drive returns for us is probably the second investment we make in that company say we put 500k to begin with what's your target ownership at at, at, at the exit at exit so i think at sort of at series a we want to be as close to say 10 percent as possible and factor in dilution from from there on out um but in our the companies that we believe in the most we probably want to have 10% of our overall fund allocated to them. So mm -hmm. that if we 10x that, we'd return the fund. Now, Good. what is important for us is the blended valuation we come in at. Weighted blended valuation. So if I put in 500K at say 10 million, 
what matters more is the two million that I'm say put in at um, 2025. Mm -hmm. That's going to have more of an impact. And then maybe I'll put some more money in later on, but I want to get to a three to four million invested in that company at a blended valuation where if it exits at say 300 million, I'm 10 xing and returning the fund. Yeah. Factoring in some dilution down the line as well. So that that's kind of like what 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 I'm thinking about. If you're only going to invest a sub 500k check and that's what you've got capacity for and you're not really going to follow on, then yeah, I think you you want to be coming in at 5 million at maximum 10 million to then to to allow that return to be generated uh, and factoring in that if you're coming in that early, you will have significant dilution further on. We have a sort of a, to contrast that approach, the sort of a, a few concentrated bets approach to sort of a YC kind of model. Mm. If we were to apply it to uh, 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 sort of a, the, the, the kind of companies we discussed, Kazakhstani companies yeah. focusing on Central Asian, what do you sort of do you think uh, um, if, it, if you were to build the sort of day zero venture firm focusing on Kazakhstani companies, focusing on Central Asia, how would you how would you think about it? So what what is kind of interesting and why the YC model works from a returns perspective is the terms that they have mm -hmm. for companies that take their money in that you they don't give you a huge amount of money, but they do get a big stake. Mm -hmm. Like their implied entry valuation is rather rather better than everyone else's. Now that is because you get brand, you get network, and it does add a lot of value. And I think especially for emerging mar startups from emerging markets, it's a it's a real sort of validation when you're speaking to US based investors that mm -hmm. I am YC Summer Twenty One or whatever. Correct. Even if you hardly ever turned up, you hated it, and you learned nothing from it, doesn't matter. You show that you have YC on the cap table for international investors. It makes a difference. Sort of like uh, having a, a sort of a bleeding crimson, like just sort of having a Harvard uh, yeah. sort of a, a badge on, on, exactly. your, on, your, on, yeah. your, on your sweater. Um, exactly. Yeah. And it's, it's the reason that model works is they're getting that kind of, in effect, sweat equity on top of the cash that they're investing. So therefore, they have a bigger ownership stake at the beginning. They, they have that ability to follow on with their kind of follow-on funds. But if you ignore that, then I think if you were to build from a sort of ground zero a f fund like that in Central Asia, I think you'd have to figure out, okay, why is someone going to give me an, uh, there's a fund out of China called SOSV that sort of has a similar model where it says, we have this network, like we have a standardized check we give you mm -hmm. of whatever, hundreds, a few hundred thousand, Plus, we take some additional equity because we provide this network. And if you really do have that network and you really have that ability to add value, I think that's a way where you can build big enough ownership stakes at the beginning relative to actually the amount of money you're putting in. Mm -hmm. So your fund size isn't very big. Your check size is quite small, but you're getting a disproportionate ownership. That can actually be a way to deliver very strong returns on the broader fund level. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one option. The alternative being going down what we're doing, being that more concentrated. I think what that does is the the issue. Why does YC works because there's a lot of follow-on funding that f follows YC. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to set something up in Central Asia, who is your follow-on funding? Correct. Like you might be getting good ownership stakes in good businesses. But if there's no follow-on funding and you don't have the capacity to provide it, I think you, you're, you might be stuck with a bunch of these companies saying, oh, that was such a good idea, <laughs> such a good team, but they just, they couldn't, there was no one to, to right. lead that $2 million round they needed. And so I think for, from our perspective is saying, okay, we can, we can come in with that 500K check to maybe lead a seed, but we can also come in and help lead and put together that $5 million Series A with a $2 million check Because you us. know that the, the, there is lack of capital in the region. Yeah. Yeah. So and if an international investor and what we're trying to do and position ourselves as is if, if there's a company we're invested in and we're kind of bringing it to investors, that that's kind of the, the approval. And when it comes to this, this region, that they're doing the right sort of thing. Like, as you say, we've seen all the deals. So if we've chosen to back someone and investors but think that we're, we, we do a good job, it's that kind of validation. And also you want to raise 5 million and you have 2 million already committed from one of your existing, existing investors makes your conversation a lot easier. Now, mm. the new company might not like the terms. They might not like you. They might not like the company, but it significantly de-risks that funding side. So in terms of, while I think that kind of YC model could work and is interesting, I think difficult to actually sustain it beyond 
until, and, and I mean, the good thing here in Kazakhstan and across Central Asia is now you have got more investors coming up. So obviously most lo- lo- launch their fund, White, 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 White Hill Capital with the Tumaris. Um, Big Sky. Big Sky, My Ventures. In Uzbekistan, you've now got Aloka Ventures. Uh, as part of the bank, you've got UzVC, which we help manage as well. Uh, in Azerbaijan, you've got Caucasus Ventures. In Georgia, you've now got the, the 500 Global Fund, uh, as well as another local fund there. Obviously, you've now got uh, Google for Startups here. You've got Plug and Play in Uzbekistan. So the supply of funding is increasing. Because like, I remember when we started coming to Uzbekistan in like 2018, talking about VC, and like no one knew what it meant. Like The government didn't think a startup could be software. It had to be hardware. Like technology wasn't software, it was hardware. And so it was an interesting conversation to try and have. So the ecosystem is developing very rapidly, but I still think that ability to provide meaningful follow-on funding for portfolio companies when there is limited liquidity available in the broader market is an important kind of part of an investment strategy in these in, in, in these regions. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Uh, when it comes to your fund, uh, is it fair to say that you have sort of a three-year deployment period and... In sort of a 10 to 12 year kind of lifetime? Yeah, so fun, fun life 10 standard sort of 10 plus two, actually kind of initial deployment period is, is sort of up to five years for initial investments. But I'd say we probably expect to make new investments within the first three years to allow looking at how long like this business Cloudways that I mentioned in uh, Pakistan took nine years to build to exit. Now, it never raised VC funding. So that that growth was probably slower than it would could have been otherwise. But that's a, another uh, that's, a, that's another point. But if you're looking at that as the sort of timeline, can't really be afford to be making new investments after five years, which leaves you with a fairly short time frame to be exiting. Mm. When it comes to your prorata rights, do you sort of do you take a discount to the next round or what's sort of your approach to sort of follow on rounds? Um, so it's so a follow on. Uh, we try not to overcomplicate it or to mm-hmm. sort of, I, I, I never want to put something in there that might put off other investors. Mm. Like, because ultimately, if we believe in that company and we're on the inside, we should be able to know what the right valuation is. And occasionally we had kind of portfolio companies where we've invested in the previous round and they've got terms for the new round. And we've gone, look guys, I really like what you're doing, but we just can't, Mm. underwrite that valuation no matter how well we know you it doesn't fit into the sort of return profile we're looking for super discipline huh i would try to be anyway and it's difficult because you you obviously you know the founders personally as you said it's like a relationship you've done the dating you're now going out it's like this is sort of going to the next stage like maybe you're about to move in together and you're kind of going well you went to sure. uh, you went to sack uh, sort of saunas with uh, sort of intermittent. <laughs> that was a memorable. Exactly. <laughs> we actually yeah. haven't gone uh, in a while. I mean, it's I guess it's it's about time. Yeah. Uh, you also have a P practice as part of uh, Sturgeon with a much bigger sort of fund size, two fifty million. Yeah. T- tell us more about that. So that's a, that's a separate team. So that's mm-hmm. the the fund you're referring to, re- referring to being the, the the Chevron fund here mm-hmm. in Kazakhstan. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we have a team of seven people based here in Almaty that manage that fund, that fund being focused uh, almost almost exclusively on larger private equity deals, mm-hmm. as you say, and with a, ver- with a very Kazakh focus as part of uh, Chevron's reinvestment agreement into the country. Um, so that team we kind of, we, we, we put together to lead that. They're now actively kind of due diligencing and, and deploying money into, in, 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 into those businesses. And if we, let's say, there are some sort of a late stage uh, mature companies and they have founders watching right now, what are what are some of the terms like what what is sort of what is a typical average investment check? What are the requirements to the companies to be eligible to yeah. sort of? So it's uh, one of the key requirements is that the business has to be profitable, mm-hmm. which makes it difficult to do almost impossible to do early stage technology because you don't tend to be profitable at that stage. That's not really how the game works, uh, and and this kind of uh, co- contributing to employment opportunities and the development of the Kazakh economy. Uh, typical check size really to, to make it worthwhile. We're looking at sort of five, five million dollars plus. So gotcha. there are very few technology companies that could absorb an investment of, of, of that size and meet the profitability criteria. Um, but kind of if you meet both of those, then there's, uh, I believe there's a, there's a link on the website to kind of a, a apply. Mm-hmm. Or as always, it's much better to get a warm introduction. So if you know someone who knows someone who might be involved in some way, that's uh, always a better way to, to, to pitch an investor. What are some of the requirements you have in terms of a, what's the minimum annual revenue to be sort of eligible 
to, to have an investment from this PE? Um, so I don't work ah, proactively it. on it, so okay, I don't no know worries. exactly. But I mean, look, if you're going to be raising $5 million, you might, it could be, it could be more of a greenfield project. So I don't know if that revenue one is like, it's not as true as like, if you're raising money from Sturgeon Capital VC uh, and the, our, our funds there, we're typically looking at anywhere between 500K up to a million dollars in annualized revenue is our sweet spot. Uh -huh. And that means revenue, not GMV. So that's kind of our sweet spot where we're looking to invest. So I can be very clear on that when it comes to the Chevron funds, the, the dynamics are a bit. One of the portfolio companies you have is Zoot, which is uh, yeah. like a market leader in Uzbekistan, remarkable company. I uh, I first heard of them from you. And then I, I, I met a few people who work there and I finally sort of I haven't been to Uzbekistan since March 2015, so okay. I don't know what's what's going on there. And it was really a, a, a sort of eye opening to 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 find what this company is doing, sort of this lending and fintech and buy now pay later e commerce. Yeah, so tell us more about Zood. It's sort of a real jewel in your portfolio at the moment. Well, so that, that that's a business that uh, we first invested in actually back in 2016, 2017. We were the first external investor. Uh, that deal was led by Kian and uh, him and uh, Michael, the, the founder of Zood. And they, they probably speak to each other more than they speak to their wives, which I'm sure uh, doesn't make them happy. But uh, so we, we've had a very close and sort of inside relationship in seeing how that business has, has evolved. And if you like to begin with, Zood was Zood Mall, which was this B2C e-commerce marketplace targeting countries with where the level of e-commerce penetration was still low um, and particularly with cross-border um, so launching launching in Uzbekistan and then looking at other markets in the region um, what, what what came next was Zood, Zood, Zood pay so at the time you had relatively low conversion and re relatively low average order values as well as uh, it being like 90 percent cash ca cash on delivery which has its own costs uh, with pil pilferages and, and uh, um, leakages as well so zoodpay was launched as this this B bnpl product um, with the idea to sort of drive drive conversion rates higher average order values and to shift people from cash to digital now it's been it's been phenomenally successful at that. If you look at Zood Mall as as one of the distribution channels for Zood Pay, it's gone from sort of eighty twenty cash digital to eighty twenty digital cash. So it's been a real success story there. But what they saw is the co-founder um, uh, Martin has been working in microfinance across uh, CIS for the last sort of fifteen twenty years. His experience and his team built for very strong kind of risk risk models and, and, and credit scoring based off the limited data that you have of, of people in markets like Uzbekistan. Um, and that actually, Zoodmore, while it is one distribution channel, there are actually other distribution channels for the, the, the lending and not just BNPL. BNPL, if you like, is that sort of hook, that way of building the initial credit data on individuals, but the long-term aim to then be to offer longer-term lending products either from their own balance sheet or working with other other, other banks. Uh, so that's something they've really kind of scaled, scaled in Uzbekistan. They've also grown into the Middle East. They operate in Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon. Uh, and last year, they expanded to Pakistan as well, really bringing this ecosystem, which is sort of, if you like, finished off by this e-logistics platform uh, where they, they work with the e-commerce merchants and, and uh, warehousing providers to offer SME kind of like type loans to the, to, to, to the e-commerce players themselves, uh, collateralized by the products being held in warehouses where they have visibility over them. So building this kind of ecosystem that ultimately is not dissimilar to Caspi, but without the bank. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think that kind of, because the, the bank is the expensive bit. What it does offer you is a balance sheet uh, and the ability to sort of take deposits and use those to lend, which has, has significant benefits. Uh, but kind of a lot of inspiration taken from what uh, from what Caspi has built here in, here in Kazakhstan. And uh, I, I assume Martin is sort of a, a Swiss founder or? Uh... Uh, Martin, I th I'm going to get in trouble for not remembering. I think he's Ukrainian. But, really, uh, Martin but, is, and Michael Michael is Swiss 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 Iranian. Ah, got it. So basically, European founders who picked Uzbekistan as 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 the market big, uh, sort of to 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 start this this company, and the, they worked in the region for quite some time. Yeah. So hence the the, the the insight. Yeah. What's what's next for Zoot? Uh, what's what's next for Zoot? So um, in the process of, of of closing closing a funding round at the moment. 
and it's it's really just to double down on on what they what they have been doing. It's, I mean, it's they raised not much, right? around fifty million. To, yeah, so, so to, re- yeah. Re- relative given to the, the given the size of the company, given the size of and the operations that they have, Michael's been incredibly efficient with the capital that he has raised, um, and and been able when when times are, are leaner to to be more efficient in in his operations still. Um, he's a phenomenal executor. I mean, we've had this sort of track record of he's a, he's a third time founder. Mm-hmm. He's a sort of person he, he occasionally asks us for some help with something. Usually by the time we've come up with a solution, he's done it anyway. He just sort of d- the kind of per- default, uh, uh, default to action type, type mentality that is, uh, he travels even more than I do. Like he's, he's, he's phenomenal, uh, and re- really an inspiration to, to, to work with. So from, from here, it's really just doubling down on what they've, what they've built already, uh, acts growing access to, to balance sheet in order to scale that scale the loan book through partnerships with banks, as well as debt lines, um, from other, from, from other institutions. Mm-hmm. Let's talk more about some of, some of your portfolio companies. Uh, I have a list here, um, just to kind of, uh, um, give uh, give our audience a sense of companies uh, you're investing in. Um, one one of the companies is called Abi A B H I. What do we do? Uh, so Abi is uh, a financial wellness platform aimed at uh, consumers, with also with a B two B lending angle too as well. Um, so the core product on the consumer side is earned wage access. Uh, so enabling employees to access a portion of their, their earned salary. So if you've worked uh-huh. f- half of the month, you can access up to half of your salary from Abhi. So it's, it's, it's a typical thing you see in emerging markets where employ, employees will go to their employer 20 days into the month and say, Please, my, I have my, a my, wedding. Yeah. yeah, I have a wedding, my fridge is broken, and it's very difficult for the employer from a cash flow perspective to meet those. Mm. So they try to because it's a good uh, uh, retention tool, but they're not really set up for it. So, so Abby kind of steps in in that way, and you can, app, you can access a day's worth, you can access sort of 20, 20 days' worth. It, it really depends on, on kind of what your needs are. And they operating in which market? So they are operational in Pakistan, in the UAE, and in uh, Bangladesh as well. Uh, and what they also then have on the side is sort of uh, kind of uh, invoice factoring and discounting uh, products for the corporates that they're working with, um, as well as handling kind of pay- payroll and, and providing some payroll financing for them as well. So, so really trying to be that holistic solution and providing those those financing opportunities that are not catered to by the traditional financial institutions in these in these markets. Um, and that's that's a very good case of of what I think is a, a, a strong founder combination. So you have one founder, um, uh, Omer, who, who worked abroad for 15, 20 years, investing globally, actually pr- predominantly in fintech businesses, came back to Pakistan with that kind of experience and network, and his co-founder Ali, who, who's been based in Pakistan, working in the, in the uh, tech space for the last I mean, nearly 10 years now. And that marriage of local know-how and understanding and ability to operate and get things done in, in, with the idiosyncrasies of the local market with someone who, who has the international connections and experience, I think is a very powerful mm-hmm. founder combination. Having just one or two of each is, 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 you, 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 you you're always missing something, I think. Mm-hmm. What about our zone of tech? I mean, I, I, I can, it literally means sort of like a cheap pharmacy. What do they do? What do we do? So that's a that's a that's a super interesting business actually. So they're uh, they're focused on Uzbekistan, uh, and what, what what they started with. So that the founder his 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 own background was in uh, pharma ph- ph- pharma distribution in 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 Uzbekistan, and he saw the problem that everything was uh, manual. Um, so entirely the ordering process, the store management process, uh, from from the distributor to the pharmacy to the end consumer was entirely offline and manual. So what they did to begin with was they built a, a simple sort of uh, ERP solution for the pharmacies to manage their inventory um, and and sort of have better visibility over their cash flows and and and, and this sort of thing. Then they built a, a not dissimilar product for the distributors again to give them that kind of uh, management over their inventory. Then built a layer connecting the two so that the pharmacies could order digitally from the distributors, and then build out the final layer as well is to say well for the end consumer. Um, how can they see which pharmacies near them have the medicine that they need and what the kind of what and what and what the price is? So if you like kind of capturing the entire value chain from distributor to pharmacy to end consumer, um, and then sort of building the layers across uh, to connect to connect all three. 
uh, remarkable bills bills so this this was actually one of our uh was one of our first investments as well uh first investments in uzbekistan uh so bills is a, a store management solution for uh, offline retailers predominantly focused on on fashion retail um so it's everything from inventory management to crm to integrations with online uh, platforms as well as sort of helping build their own their own websites as well um so that kind of as i said core focus on on fashion retail today they have over a thousand stores in uzbekistan using their software um they're, they're launching here in uh, launching here in kazakhstan at the moment uh, that one of the founders co-founders uh, rustam is actually here at the uh, uh, google google for startups accelerator i think it'll be, be this will be catching up with him tomorrow um and that uh, they're really kind of a standout founder from from Uzbekistan, I've always been impressed by Rostam and the team's kind of real data driven approach to everything that they do, um, and really thinking about their business uh, in, in, in with that kind of growth mindset, with that startup mindset. Not what I see sometimes, where it's maybe more of a traditional businessman or woman who is trying to morph into something more technology driven. And I think it's a it's not impossible, but it's a it's a difficult thing to do. Any other investments in Uzbekistan in your portfolio? Uh, so other investments in Uzbekistan include um, uh, Oasis, uh, Oasis, Oasis yeah. mi mi microcredit. Uh, so that's a greenfield microfinance company, sort of tech tech enabled, with an international management team that have built similar businesses elsewhere. What kind of uh, sort of SMEs are they funding? Uh, so uh, so yeah, predominantly focused on SMEs, so small retailers, uh -huh. and it's either kind of working capital or small capex type loans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. And they, I assume they work with, with banks to, to get the capital. Uh, so at the moment, kind of using their own balance sheet and ah. then looking to access uh, funding, particularly from development institutions who have a mandate to lend to SMEs. But at the moment in Uzbekistan, there isn't the equivalent of sort of KMF or one of these more developed uh, microfinance institutions here in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. um, but also in, in, in Uzbekistan, we, we help manage the government's UzVC fund, mm -hmm. which has to date made six investments in a, in a range of companies. And that's more at the pre-seed stage. So it doesn't kind of compete with where we're investing, uh, but it's more creating kind of, deal flow for yourself. Essentially. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. And they sort of early stage government money sort of, uh, Seed exactly. Yeah. And how many how many companies did, did uh, till date have made six investments? Six investments? Uh, yeah. Check size is 50, 50 up to one hundred thousand. Pretty good. Um, so kind of to yeah, invest investing alongside local investors um, and and um, and um, angels as well. Our audience definitely knows Smarta too. It's a B two B marketplace. Yeah. Started by Bolat Beck. Um, any other I guess companies worth mentioning just to kind of give some variety of. Sure. I mean, uh, so this uh, one, one, one interesting company is a business called um, uh, Data Culture, mm -hmm. which is the one that's headquartered out of the UAE, but with a global focus, founded by two Indian Indian founders whose background had been working with telcos and um, uh, uh, device manufacturers. So at uh, the large Indian telcos, as well as working at BlackBerry. Um, and what one thing they saw during that time was that um, you... Even, even the cheapest smartphones were very difficult for people to afford if they had to buy them outright. Mm -hmm. So you really rely on credit. But a lot of, for a lot of these people, it is the first type of credit they've ever taken. So non-performing loans uh, and defaults are, are, are very high. Um, but ultimately, that smartphone is much more than just a, a communication device. For a lot of them, it's how they are running their business. It's how they're, how they're making their money. So you have something which is worth to the end user more than the sort of actual value of the phone. So what they built is this, to, to summarize, a, a digital debt collections platform that collateralizes a user's smartphone to enable access to finance for those that would otherwise be, be, be uh, excluded by either the telcos themselves, if they are lending, or the device financing companies or um, uh, MFIs, banks, and what essentially it does is a data culture's uh, software is installed on the phone at the time when the loan is taken. Uh, it's undeletable. If you're able to delete it, you don't need to be taking a loan for a, for a mobile phone. So they can remotely sort of freeze your phone exactly. if, if you don't pay. Yeah. But, it's, but it's much more than that because, I mean, Google, Android has its own device locking, but the device locking is very crude. Either the device is locked or it's not. 
Whereas data cultures is really uh, product is really built around educating the end the the the, the end uh, the end user that this is not a loan that you've taken from your friend because mm-hmm. like if you lend me money and I meant to pay you back today and I arrive and I'm like look Armand I'm mm-hmm. I'm really sorry it's going to be Sunday uh-huh. you're annoyed at me maybe you're like I won't lend to you again but it's an informal relationship whereas if you're a bank and my due date is today if I don't pay you back that affects my credit score. So educating them around that. And if they miss the credit, like the payment date, then nudging them and providing them with solutions and the ability to make that, uh, to make, to make that repayment, uh, faster. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it's, it's actually, since we invested, the business has done uh, phenomenally well, a large client base across India, as well as clients in Pakistan, Nigeria, Mexico, Southeast Asia, um, and uh, scaling beyond just device financing for general consumer lending as well. So working with BNPL providers, actually working with some SME lenders as well, really lending to those sort of mom and pop corner stores where the smartphone is how you do your business. Uh, so kind of taking that software and, and continuing to sort of scale the, the, the use cases for it. Interesting. Um, take us behind the scenes. Let's say um, um, uh, the, 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 the company uh, passed through some of your initial filters. Sort of now, it's going to a committee. Sort of what what is the conversation like? Take us behind the scenes. What what what, what are you discussing? Sure. So to to get uh, we have a kind of two step IC process. So we have the uh, and um, uh, initial IC where. A kind of a, an initial IC memo is being presented. Now that memo is based on meetings that the, where the, the responsible individual has had with the company, presentation, data room, all this sort of thing. And then we have a standardized due diligence questionnaire as well for each company, which kind of goes goes through particular areas that we're interested in, sort of market, competition, product, uh, team, um uh, uh, current, like immediate challenges, long-term challenges, funding requirements, sort of very, like basically everything that we want to have a high level understanding of. And that initial IC is, is really a case of saying like, do, do we think this is an investment that will, that, that will stand up? So the questions are a kind of a mix of some, some broader ones around is, is the addressable market large enough? Is this a business model that we think can make sense? As well as maybe some more specific ones might be around the founder or might be around kind of competition. Um, and if, 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 if you pass that initial IC and we say, look, okay, we think, we think this makes sense to put the effort in and, and this, we think there is the potential this could be one of the sort of six or seven deals we might do this year. Mm-hmm. Then it's really kind of going into a much more in-depth due diligence process. So say, for example, if you're a, a B2B company, we, we'll want to speak to a few of your customers. Uh, we're going to want to spend time with more of the team to really build that conviction beyond just the founders that you've also got a team around it that can actually implement that vision. Uh, digging into the kind of comparable business models you can see in other emerging as well as developed markets to understand like, what does this business look like at scale? It was very difficult. You're coming in at sort of pre-series A. What you're doing well today might almost certainly not going to be what's going to be doing well in say five years time. So where can we see comparables? Um, where can we draw those kind of comparisons? Doing a lot of work on kind of stress testing that model that we've seen to make sure that the assumptions are correct because some of the models you get from founders with all the best intentions in the world make absolutely no sense there's no underlying logic to to what drives revenue and and what drives margins in whichever direction you're you're forecasting the number of times where it's just like everything grows 10 percent month over month forever <laughs> that would be lovely. Yeah, that's that's, but, a, that's a Paul Graham requirement. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, but what's what, what's the cost to doing that? Like, yeah. uh, like if you, t- it's like okay, so uh, how, how do you earn revenue? You sign up customers. How do you sign up customers? You spend money on on marketing. Uh, what's your like? At how many customers you sign up depends on your conversion rate. Then you start backing out a, a, a model that has has a logic to it, and which is M one that you can say, okay, is this going to be a business of the significant enough size that it can generate the sort of returns that we as a fund are, 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 are looking for because like each each company that we invest in has to have that potential to return the fund mm-hmm. and sometimes we look at deals where maybe they're either they're a little bit later stage so we can't come in at a valuation that we think makes sense or we're not willing to put in a three million dollar check straight away. We like we kind of like it, but we'd only be comfortable doing a million. If we only do a million, we won't be able to generate our returns. So we have to be disciplined there. Or it's a smaller business, and I see quite a few of these where it's like, you know what? I think this business will do pretty well. 
I think fr from a founder's perspective, it'll do pretty well, but I just don't see how it will grow beyond, like maybe they can get to 10 million, like well, let's say not 10 million, like $5 million in revenue with good margins, but it's going to be very difficult for them to scale either into bigger markets or new products or services that can go from five to 50. And if they can't go from five to 50, it's just not going to work for us as an investor. Like maybe they're doing 5 million with a million dollars in net income. A founder, great. Amazing. Now imagine that you're sitting on this cash cow of a business. Then I think maybe what's interesting is what's the next business that founder founds? Because it's like they've already done the nice one that gets them gets them a sort of uh, healthy cash flow and they can they can live a comfortable life. What's the next one they do? Because then I think you've got someone with the experience to to kick on and do something more more interesting. Um, so as a lot of the kind of questions we're asking is like, is the founder got the that grit, that determination, that that ability to uh, to, to, to keep going when, when times are tough and, and this sort of thing. And that, that old me is then feeding through to that sort of final conversation. As I said, it's like six or seven investments a year. So we're not, we're not in a rush to deploy. It really has to be that excitement, that conviction around an investment before we'll, uh, before we'll commit. Mm -hmm. Are you driven by consensus or a single hell yes from a partner sufficient to overcome all, all the news from my colleagues no it, it has it re, it driven dri, driven by consensus so um, it was basically there has to be an agreement by yeah from all three of you and we're, and we're, and we're happy that if um like if there are more questions coming up like someone keeps having more questions just to keep going back to the founders assuming they're not just kind of we don't tend to be sort of uh superfluous ones but if there really is a sort of problem that one of us isn't comfortable about then yeah we will we will go back to the founder again and and say look this is just something that we haven't you we haven't understood well enough like help us understand we like what you're doing and that's really the kind of questions the way I, it's a slightly pretentious way of saying it but like when you as an investor when you meet a founder for the first time there is complete information asymmetry i.e. they know 100% of their business and you know nothing. You might know the business model, you might, might know the market they operate in, you might have heard a bit, but really you don't know anything. So that due diligence is trying to bridge that gap to get to the point where I can say with confidence or as much confidence as I need that I believe that what you're kind of pitching me is, is true today and can be true in the future. Mm -hmm. And that's where those questions are coming. It's not a sort of, not just trying to be difficult for the sake of being difficult. It's because something doesn't make sense enough for us. Yeah, and plus you are just making six to eight bets a year. I mean, you're yeah. super selective. Um, we, uh, we have a, quite a few uh, MBAs in our audience, I believe, and uh, uh, MBAs love frameworks. So, yeah. um, I mean, there are a few frameworks, I mean, uh, uh, which I use typically in, in, in venture firms. I mean, I, I there's this sort of this uh, flood, uh, floodgate, uh, non-consensus and right kind of uh, uh, approach, sort of when you look at four quadrants, you have to be non-consensus and right, uh, and right yeah. to, 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 to deliver results. I also like this framework, which I heard last year from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, from one firm. They do this thing called pre-mortems. They imagine this comp uh, sort of they sort of play, uh, they, they play the sort of try to simulate the future. Let's say it's ten years. This company failed. Let's list all the reasons why it failed. Yeah. And then they sort of like try to think, try to think it through. Maybe find ways to maybe talk to a founder to to sort of discuss those risks. Maybe some of the frameworks you typically apply. Well, so none of if us, uh, none of us at Surgeon have done have done MBAs, um, so I guess we don't have that same inclination to to, to frameworks. And uh, the problem I have a lot of those frame, frameworks is quite often they end up being restrictive, and they're all most almost all of them were designed for developed markets. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what might make sense in a developed market? You have to create a new one, huh? Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, I guess one of the one of the key things for us is to say, okay, we have. There's two things we're underwriting. One is between now and the next funding round. Mm -hmm. And that really is critical. Like, what are the assumptions that this funding round will validate so that you can raise the next one? Whether it is entering new markets or launching a new business line or like a business model or whatever. Like, that is probably the, 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 the key thing. If you, don't, if you don't achieve those, it's going to be very difficult to raise the next round. If you can't raise the next round, business is basically dead. So, so really thinking of like trying to distill exactly what it is and quantify 
what it is so that we can then track against that and say, okay, it was entering a new market. Each month is saying, well, like, how's that going? Okay, you set up like month one, maybe you set up the office, you found a sort of GM for the market. Okay, month two is like, okay, is that when you're actually targeting customers and keeping a very kind of close eye on that? And then on the flip side of that is the more of the longer term kind of challenges or assumptions that you'll have to validate is like, it does this business model scale, like do, do your unit economics stay the same or improve with scale? Or ultimately, will you be in a market where as a sort of competition increases, you'll be driven to a point of basically just survival. Um, that I think those, once it, once it, if it gets to that kind of final IC stage and we're, we're really sort of keen, keen on a business, that's probably the final sort of hurdle and framework, if you like, where we're trying to, to, to know, like define what success will look like so we can as much as possible spot if it's not happening. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. Just a few questions before we come to a close. Uh, what happens post-investment? You pick the company, they passed all your filters. What happens next? So what I think is quite quite nice about Sturgeon, like we're, we're being a small team, is whoever basically sources you will be the same one that's managing you post post investment. So you'll have built that relationship over time. You you know that that person really knows who you are. It's not like an analyst finds you, an associate due diligence is you, a partner kind of signs off on it. But then it's like whatever. Like I, I know that works for bigger firms, and you're a bigger firm, you kind of have to do it. It means maybe more work for us as partners with companies and kind of keep keeping tabs on them. Um, but broadly, like our, our mentality or our uh, philosophy is we're not there to be involved in sort of day-to-day -day operations. We wouldn't be investing in you if, if we felt that was a sort of challenge. But it's really there more, around more of the kind of strategic issues. So it's particularly around fundraising, which is should not be a concern when you've just raised money, but is always there kind of in the back of your mind. Um, it's do, around, you, do you suggest your founders to, let's say, kind of uh, prepare for the next round in, let's say, 18 to 24 months typically? Uh, so we, yeah, we typically say to have enough money for 18 to 24 months with a view that you're going to want to be starting to fundraise with six months plus of runway still left. So you're not there with investors going, well, I know you're about to run out of money. So <laughs> here's like, a term sheet for you. Yeah. I take the, your entire company. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, good VCs won't do that, right. but maybe more of kind of some more traditional investors might, 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 some come of them might go sort of might give a Mr. Wonderful deal. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, you exactly. pay royalty <laughs> until you're dead. <laughs> um, but uh, it's, it's then on kind of more of that strategic, strategic side. So a lot of it, uh, to, uh, a lot around uh, new market entry. So Zood, Zood, Zood for example, uh, we went with Michael, the founder, to Pakistan for two weeks, kind of facilitated all the meetings with, with banks, regulators, startups, VCs, to build that picture, help them identify the company they ultimately ended up acquiring, uh, as well as sort of the, some of the team they've ended up hiring. So that being kind of one example, uh, we actually have another portfolio company at the moment, which is merging with, an, with, with, with another business where they've had a kind of JV for a while, but we not only sort of help with that introduction to the JV, but have been the one in the middle aligning interests and bridging the sort of gap between perception and, and reality on both sides. Mm -hmm. So it's really in areas kind of like, like, like that, where we're looking to add value on an ongoing and consistent basis. Super hands on. Um, yeah. When, 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 when we need, you, when it. You need yeah. it. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if everything's going well, then, then look, uh, not, not to worry, but like one of the portfolio companies like this up this afternoon, we're sort of going through that sort of 12 to 18, a 12 to 18 month budget for them to say, okay, well, what should be the strategy for fundraising, when and how much, what is that sort of path to break even to profitability um, and to have real clarity on that because that's not one you want to screw up. I mean, you screw that one up and you find yourself with a great business but no money in the bank. Nothing else really matters. Yeah, you want to have some uh, sort of fuel in, in, your, in your tank. Um, one of the examples you gave um, was about sort of this non-venture-backed kind of type of businesses. And uh, that's a very important question. Let's double click on that. Sort of define a business, which is a wonderful business, wonderful cash flow generating business, making the, 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 the owners really sort of really well off, but not venture backed. Can you, can you define what non venture backed is? It's sort of a, to kind of uh, um, prevent founders from getting into a situation when they raise money for a business. Yeah. Which is just not a venture scale, yeah. and which is fine. Like let's, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's it's totally fine, and yeah. and it's actually, if you exit your business for say 
20 million, but you own 80% of it. Yeah. Life's good. Like, yeah, that's a phenomenal result anywhere in the world, let alone in Central Asia. You'll be one of the richest guys in the room anywhere you go. You can start um, your own fan. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think, I think it's, um, how you really, what is the scale of the opportunity you're going after? And is, is it big enough? And is it really something you can capture? I think often kind of at, at the beginning when you're just starting out, you have these kind of ideas, but maybe, and maybe you do raise a bit of money early on, but you're giving up say five, 10% of the business at a very low valuation. So kind of it's, it's any result will be fine. You could probably buy them out with dividends over time if, if it becomes a cash flow one. But probably at that point when you're getting to raise, say you want to like, oh, I'm going to raise 500K to a million, you're, you're really probably at that point committing to being a, a far more significant sized size business, mm -hmm. um, particularly if you're getting to sort of a million, a million plus. And there it's to really understand like, what, what are you going to do with that money? Like, how are you going to deliver a, a return on investment with that money, which will deliver a valuation to give your investors their return on investment? And that really is right sizing the opportunity and understanding your addressable market really broken down. Like if you're targeting like bills, fashion retailers, like bills know, like has the data on the number of fashion retailers in, in every country in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. You, from there, you can very clearly model out what the revenue opportunity is. What that revenue opportunity is defines what your theoretical maximum valuation is. Okay, you're never going to be 100% market share. So even if you're 30%, 50%, that's the big, that's the size of business you can be. Now, maybe you think, you know what, I can do this in Central Asia, but then I'm going to go to other markets and scale there. We've seen a few businesses do that. Um, uh, Clockster being a good example from here, from here in Kazakhstan, expanding to Indonesia, where you have a more significant addressable market. And I think you can really deliver more of those venture back returns. Now for them, Central Asia is the perfect testing market. You can build significant revenues, test your product, prove it out, and then use that as the opportunity to expand elsewhere. I, I think it's a model that works, but is, is really thinking like, what is it you want to do as a founder? And, and is that addressable market there to justify the time, money, and effort that you're going to raise and, and put in to deliver a company with revenues and evaluation to justify the money that you've raised? Good point. Uh, you made quite a few investments in Uzbekistan, but only one in Kazakhstan. Any 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 new sort of uh, any new investments coming up? And are you looking at companies from from? Here? Uh, we are looking at a couple of companies at the moment. Um, mentioned mentioned Clockstra. I've known uh, I've known um, Yerjan for, for 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 a couple of years now. He's been very impressed by him as a founder, uh, particularly strong on the kind of product side, and and have seen sort of the Clockster product evolve, I think as a kind of as a holistic solution for that sort of blue collar management, it's it's very, very strong. Uh, looking at them, I mean, we, for us, in that case, we're still trying to build really our conviction around the, uh, the Indonesian market and the opportunity set there. Um, looking at a couple of other ones as well, which there might be an, an announcement soon. Sure, so that's I'll, amazing. Uh, looking I'll, forward uh, to it. We'll, uh, we'll leave it, leave it, leave it at that. Uh, tease, tease you with that one. <laughs> nice. Um, we have a section where a uh, guest recommends uh, books, movies, uh, documentaries. So what are some of your favorite books? Maybe the, the books you uh, sort of reread or gift? Um, so I mean, one, one of my, I'll go, go th three, three books. One is uh, sort of history related. So I did an Arabic and Middle Eastern history degree. History is like what I really enjoy reading and why I was personally so interested in this part of the world anyway. And like, I love traveling here. It's like, I get paid to go to the countries I want to go to on holiday anyway. So I, have, I know I'm, I know I'm very lucky, but it's, uh, the Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan. It's a phenomenal history of Central Asia, the Middle East, uh, the Silk Roads, obviously. And then how, when Europe discovered South America and the gold that they stole there shifted the balance of power from sort of center and east to west. And then the rise of the U.S. has also kind of extended that, but how this sort of theory that that power is now shifting back to what is more the natural core of the global economy and society, and that being Central Asia and the Middle East and along these Silk Roads. I mean, now it's China's Belt and Road Initiative, but still those trade routes that link large populations and wealth in different parts of the world. Uh, so that that's a fascinating read. Uh, always, always uh, recommend that to people who want to learn more about our markets. One of my friends sort of uh, gave an interesting analogy. So he was saying that um, the fact that we were on, or we were on Silk Road, sort of, uh, I don't know, like many, many years ago, 
uh, sort of suggests a, a business model, which is really natural to us. And what is it? Commission per transaction. <laughs> Someone is passing by. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you, exactly. You, you charge <laughs> toll fee. That that all that all trading. It's like, yeah, yeah. Uh, buying, buying, selling, whatever it may be. No, yeah. I, I, I like that. Yeah, uh, commission, commission based uh, marketplace yeah. as, a, as a as a as a region, let alone not as, as a, not, yeah. not just. So a marketplace is a, is a very natural business yeah. model for Kazakhstan. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. I haven't, I haven't heard that before. So Silk Roads by Peter Frankopan. Um, Power Law, which is on the history of uh, venture capital. capital. I, f- I forget who it's by. But Sebast- um, uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Malaby. Malaby, think. exactly. Yeah, wonderful yeah. book. Excellent book. And I think it really, uh, now I work on as, as a VC. So a book that tells me that I'm more important is maybe something that's kind of, I'm biased towards liking it. But a fascinating history of how all these kind of innovations, particularly in America, but also elsewhere, is uh, it would not have happened without the team and the founders and sometimes some government regulation and this sort of thing, but also would never have happened without the VC funding that enabled it at a time when no one else would have given them money and would never have got the project off the ground. And I think that is still true, whether you look at, if you count emerging markets as emerging technologies, whether that's in, uh, environmental, AI, deep tech, uh, in more developed markets, or actually just emerging economies and societies like we're in. I think if you don't have that venture funding to kickstart the ecosystem, it won't it won't sort of uh, get reach its potential. So that that being uh, the one on kind of more work related, and then um, a gentleman in Moscow. Uh, it's a fiction book. Um, again, I, I, f- I forget the name of the author, um, but just a really beautifully written book about a a Russian aristocrat at the uh, at the time of the Russian Revolution who ends up locked in this hotel and spends, is sort of arrested in this hotel. But he, he lives in there, but he can't leave for it's like 50 years. Can he go outside? No, Do- he's stuck. Doesn't leave the hotel for the entire time. But it's a beautifully written book where it basically tells the history of the Soviet Union for a sort of 50 odd years, but through his anecdotes, as what he sees in the hotel, who is in the hotel, what conversations is he having with the people who work there, the guests. It's just, and it's so beautifully written as well. Um, he, he's written another book called The Lincoln Highway, which is about the more US focused. But A Gentleman in Moscow is, is really one that, if for, for, as a fiction book, is really one that I really recommend. Really, really cool. Any documentaries or movies? Um, I don't really, I try and read more than watch TV and, mm. uh, and also traveling a lot. Don't typically watch, uh, a, hu- a huge amount of telly. What do you, what do you do in, in planes? Uh, either sleep because I, I quite often fly overnight. If I'm flying overnight, I try and sleep. If I'm flying during the day, it's actually a time that I do a lot of work because no emails coming in, no messages can do that thing, which is like, you know, it's going to take three hours but it's just finding three hours in the day to set aside. So quite often flights, or I'll just pick some like Avengers film and just switch off the brain and, and watch that instead. <laughs> gotcha. Any hobbies? Um, hobbies. Uh, so do a lot of kind of um, exercise where um, the the hospitality of all the countries that I'd get the, I'm fortunate enough to travel to is exceptional, but that that, that involves a lot of eating. And I love eating. Like I love Central Asian food. Uh, like first thing I had for dinner last night was horse steak. <laughs> I'm a big fan. Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Georgian, Azeri, Iranian, any of it. Like I, I love it. And that's a bit of a problem. Like it's you know, a sort of constant battle between uh, sort of staying vaguely in shape. So, so do a lot of exercise. I enjoy it and, and that side of things. Uh, reading and, and kind of like always trying to sort of like le- particularly sort of uh, blogs and, 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 and sort of articles on most of it's VC or emerging market related or, or history related. Um, and then also like to try and do quite a bit of charity work as well. So um, I, from a personal satisfaction perspective, that's something I really enjoy doing. So volunteering with like kids teaching or uh, these these sorts of things. In London? Uh, London based. So haven't been doing so much of it recently because I've been traveling so much, but uh, uh, we're actually, so I mentioned the kind of impact side of what Sturgeon does. We're actually just launching uh, the Sturgeon Foundation, 
So the Sturgeon Foundation is focused on providing scholarships to women and underprivileged students in the markets where we invest to study technology and uh, kind of uh, startup relevant degrees. The Will Kazakhstani citizens be, be eligible for it? So at the moment, so we, we launched this sort of uh, in an ad hoc fashion a couple of years ago in Uzbekistan, mm -hmm. working with a couple of the universities there. What we've done in the last 12 months is actually bring in a board of trustees, some really, really like uh, fantastic individuals, uh, really humbled to have them involved um, and now formalizing it more. So for the next year or so, we'll just be focusing on Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. But the idea is so that the foundation is funded by the some of the management fees that we generate on the funds that we manage. So the idea being that over time, as we grow our own AUM, that money, the amount of money available will hopefully increase. Once we are confident in how, in the processes and systems we have, in terms of identifying partner institutions, scholars, but then also supporting them during their education as well as after, then we will look to not only kind of bring in funding maybe from outside, but also expand into other countries as well. The dream maybe in 10 years time is that we have Sturgeon scholars from every country where we invest and that they've gone on to found businesses. Could it could be technology, could be anything else. Uh, there's no requirement that they go into the space, but the uh, idea is we can encourage maybe a more diverse group of people to work in it. And uh, in 10 years time, if we can have maybe a few hundred, maybe even it's over a thousand, I don't know, we get, it's easy to get carried away, then that's something that... I know that I and, and the rest of the team will be really proud of. It can come full circle. They, they, they sort of go to college with your, with your help and then they can come to you yeah. at age of 30 plus uh, with, with a wonderful startup idea and some traction. Yeah, and the, the idea as well is that because we have these portfolio companies, they can get work experience alongside their education within our portfolio or other companies we know so that they're getting more than just that education experience. Mm, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Robin. Um, we typically end with uh, a question from a guest. Uh, do you have anything to ask our audience? And uh, as usual, the, the, the winner will get a T-shirt. Uh, uh, sort of anything you have to ask? My question is, so when we think about any of the countries that we invest in, um, is, are there are enormous inefficiencies across the economy and society that affect the day-to-day -day lives of businesses and consumers. Now, I guess I've kind of drunk the Kool-Aid and I, I don't want to be too sort of uh, uh, evangelical about the power of technology to solve those problems. But I think there are a lot that can be solved through technology or technology-enabled solutions, which allow for a degree of efficiency and scale that traditional businesses can't do. So kind of in that context of saying, okay, across uh, whether it's Kazakh or, or, or other economies and, and societies, there are all these inefficiencies that exist. I mean, wh where do you think is the, the most exciting opportunity to build a technology or technology-enabled startup that you believe can, can solve a really fundamental problem at scale within this country or within this region or even elsewhere? Interesting. So given uh, the inefficiencies you see in, in the market and in your personal life, what are the biggest opportunities to tackle those? Um, thank you so much, Robin. This was a thank pleasure. Thank you, Armand. It was, a, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much. I mean, this kind of uh, podcast gives me an opportunity to ask, to ask a bunch of questions I actually never asked you before. So it's, a, yeah. it's sort of a great format. And thanks a lot, Robin. I mean, continued success with, with, with your fund. Uh, looking forward to 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 kind of to meeting more companies from your portfolio and uh, having more scholars who got your help from uh, from from your foundation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and uh, be so good they cannot ignore you.